It's game time, baby. Yeah. Shit, we got volume. <clears throat> Get this shit cracking. Check one, two, one, two. Give me a thumbs up if we got volume. It's game time, baby. Thumbs up. Okay, let's go. Let's play some music. We'll get this shit cracking. Welcome to Hoodstocks on a Sunday evening. It's a nice day out there. The sun came out. Said hi for a minute. Yeah, hit that like. Hit that subscribe. You know what to do, baby. Let's go. you all for tapping in with us this Sunday evening. Appreciate your time 1,000%. I want to give a big shout out to Steezy. Everybody keep on telling me I'm saying the name wrong. They say it's Stizzy, but I like Steezy, baby. You know, so I'm going to say Steezy. Um, looking for some good quality cannabis. I mean, killer quality cannabis. Hit up the folks at Killer Kush. They specialize in bringing you the best quality available from OG to exotics. They got it all. Hit them up at Killer Kush Cali at gmail.com or on IG at Killer Kush underscore underscore 420. And matter of fact, they got a location right up the street from here, East Los Angeles. They are called East LA Exotics and they are located at 6009 East Olympic Boulevard. Okay, this podcast is brought, brought to you by Attorney Nicholas Roseberg. He's a certified specialist in criminal law. Attorney Roseberg is based in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, Roseberg specialized defending all strike offenses, firearm and gang allegations, sales of controlled substances. For the latest updates, go to at Attorney Rosenberg on Instagram and TikTok. And you know that boy, Attorney Rosenberg, is punching back on criminal cases, baby. Okay, OC's new hottest Tijuana taco spot, Swazos, baby. In the city of Stanton, don't play with it. Uh, located at 10338 Beach Boulevard, Staten, California. And also check them out on their IG at Swazos Tacos underscore OC. All right. <clears throat> Y'all been waiting for this, huh? You guys ready to go? I know you are. Here we go. Out of San Gabriel Valley, Southern Califas. The great, the powerful, the godfather of black and gray, the homie, the myth, the soil, the seed to you offsprings. Everybody, give it up for the legend, Freddie Negretti. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, to brother. Be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you're here, bro. I know we've been talking about this for a cool minute. And uh, finally, you know, we're able to just connect these dots, brother. And I'm very uh, grateful. And I know everybody in this room and everybody that's on the, the chat right now, um, they're excited to see you here at Hoodstocks, brother. So thank you cool. as well. Yeah. Um, How's life been? Great. Yeah. Busy. Busy. But good. Yeah. Slinging that ink, Can't huh? Complain. Yeah, slinging ink. Uh, doing some projects, got a tattoo show coming up, got a lot of things in the works, so got to stay busy. Keeps uh, me healthy. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, brother. yeah. I mean, this is kind of like a random question, but so what is it, Monday through Friday, are you slinging ink? Uh, I take Thursdays and Sundays off, so I'm working five days. Five days a week. And then I'm trying to do all this other stuff in between, and you know, I'll take a day off here and there you know, to do, get things done too, but uh, pretty much five days a week. For how long? I'm down to one tattoo a day. <laughs> no, but how many years have you been have you been at, going at it? Oh, she so got a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I got ten fingers. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be enough. No, I didn't think but, so. But uh, you know, um, yeah, I started tattooing professional, 1977. So. Wow, that's well. That's the year I was born, brother. Was it? Yeah, February twenty fifth, nineteen seventy seven, baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a good year for you and me, bro. Yeah. You know, I'm just not happy about that thing that I flew out of, bro. You know. <laughs> no, that was and, fucked uh, up. But actually, I, you know, I, 
I uh, started tattooing like 1969, 1970s, hand poking, uh, 73, 74, uh, you know, uh, started using homemade machines. Let's, you know, let's, so. let's, let's, excuse me on this, but I think we're going to get to that. Let's, let's do this, that. brother. Yeah. Okay. Does it, I mean, I know you've done a lot of interviews throughout your years, but do, does it pain you to share your past? Nah. No, not at all. Even the, you know, and I try to be candid and open and transparent. You know, I'm willing to talk about, you know, uh, the the bad side of my life, you know, the bad parts. And just, uh, you know, I like telling my story, you know, because uh, not only am I, you know, uh, giving a little bit of history, yeah. uh, you know, you know, it was also my generation in the 70s that, re you know, really brought on, you know, low rider cars and, Cholo style, graffiti, and also tattooing, you know. So I've always been at the helm of uh, our Chicano style. The forefront, know? correct? Yeah. The so, forefront, pioneer, buddy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, being, having talent, I was uh, the, the hood tiger, too, you know. Yeah. We'd roll up on a wall, and I'd be the one doing all the, all the spray painting, you know. So, uh, you know, um, I've always been there in the forefront, and I think uh, that it's important to share that history. If people are interested in our culture, not only our youngsters, but you know, people all over the world. You know, they want to know what happened in East LA. You know, and uh, they're so into our art and our style. You know, um, does that blow it, your mind seeing dudes from a, what is it like uh, Hong, Hong Kong, Vietnam, <laughs> yeah. Japan? Japan, Thailand, there you go, not Hong Kong, South, Japan, yeah. Japan, South Korea, you know, all, all, all of Asia and uh, it, Europe, Italy, you know what I mean? They just, they love that style. It's so, crazy, uh, bro, because the homies out here are trying to be black dudes now, and the dudes over there in fucking Japan are trying to be homies, bro. I don't know what's going on right here, bro. There's something <laughs> in the water, doggy. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I think there might be Kool-Aid coming out of the water hose. I'm not sure, dog. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I don't get out much, but... <laughs> That's good, bro. That's good. You know, yeah, I, I'm sticking with the, the culture, the Chicano culture. Yes, sir, you know bro. And you've done an amazing but, job. Bro. You know, in Thank reality, you. you know, uh, I mean, when I was a kid in juvenile hall, I, I, you know, I remember, uh, you know, my first time going to juvenile hall, I was like 12 years old, ran away, incorrigible, all that stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> and went into receiving, and, uh, you know, there was just... No whites, just blacks, Mexicans, and uh, Mexicans were all cholos, you know, and uh, the blacks were a different style, you know. Uh, they they uh, wore bright clothes, they had big afros, which that was their style. It was cool, but I think uh, over the years, our Chicano style also influence them. Let's go, baby. I was gonna ask you that, bro. <laughs> because you know what, I put that, I put that, I said, you know what, bro? And I'm just clowning about the Kool-Aid coming out the water hose, bro. You know, even though we wish it did, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I have said that because it's a melting pot and now a lot of homies, you, you know, they use the N word and stuff like that. And there's one side that doesn't like it. And there's some, some sides that are kind of like neutral, like me, bro, that kind of understands it, bro. It's hip hop, you know what I mean? It sounds cool. Uh, but I, I had put a video out saying that hey, brothers have taken stuff from us, and and these dudes were banging. It was it was there were brothers on there like, what are we taking from you besides your women, homie? You know what I mean? Like they were they were kind of talking some shit in the comments, but it's a fact. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to ram it down your throat if you ain't trying to hear it, but it's a fact, bro. The gang yeah. culture, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, what was that the picture on uh, the old Snoop Dogg album? You know, and he's. Standing right there, and he has a Pendleton, his khakis, and he's wearing some winos. Where did that come in from? In front of a six four, you know, six four Chevy lowriders rag top. You know, that's that's all us. That's all us. Which is okay. I mean, you know, I, I remember Juvenile Hall. You know, when they first, uh, you know, like uh, when the Crips first started, you know, um, they had a different style too. They were wearing leather jackets. They were looking like kind of. New York kind of thug, like maybe like thug, Black Panthers or something like Black Panthers that kind of thing yeah you know what I mean yeah and uh, <clears throat> but uh, they were influenced you know they were taking on this new gang culture they didn't have no gangs before you know and so they were strongly influenced by our Chicano culture not on, not only them just all these immigrants Armenians uh, <sighs> Persians you know what I mean like they're coming into America and uh, 
they're not relating with the mainstream culture. But man, they relate to our subculture. They relate to our street style. You know what I mean? Let's go, and, baby. Uh, and you know that by prison, in prison, uh, you know, Armenians and, and Russians and and some Jews, and they're all Southsiders. Yeah, you shit, I'm, my, my pops is a Russian Jew, bro, and my mom's Mexican. Come on, yeah. let's go. Round of applause for me. Yeah, <laughs> my, mom, my mother's Jewish, you know, my dad's Mexican. Bro. That's dope, bro. So and we, you know, so my mother, you know, my mom and dad, you know, my dad was gangster from uh, Kern Montevideo. That's one of the oldest Montevideos, you know. My mom was actually from Aloyo, Mara. But, uh, you know, in Boyle Heights, there used to be a Jewish neighborhood. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, back back in the 40s, 40s and 50s, you know. And uh, there were immigrants coming from Europe when all the madness was going on over there with Hitler and stuff. And now uh, they settled right here in Boyle Heights, you know. And there was an uneasy relationship between Hispanics and Jews. They they didn't get along, you know, and um, mainly because the Jews did not like it when their daughters would go to the Suave Pachuco guys. Shit, <laughs> that was the word. I'd I think that's too, what bro. drove them out. I'd be like, you fuck know? them motherfuckers. <laughs> and they said, you know what? Bye bye, boy. Heights. We're out of here. But yeah, fucking that, Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hills, bitch. <laughs> but that's my mom and. My mom and my dad's story. My my dad was Pachuco gangster, you know. My mom was uh, a daughter of Jewish immigrants, you know, living in Boyle Heights, and that's amazing. And bro. Fell in love with my dad, and just she didn't want anything to do with uh, being Jewish, you know. She took on the culture, uh, joined the barrio, you know. <laughs> Ended up going to prison, you know, for killing some, killing some hyena from another hood. But I I, I saw a little yeah. bit of an interview with a zip gun. Yeah, it was a zip gun. Yeah. Zip so gun, you know, bro. so they how, how they made the zip guns before they take a antenna from a car, and you know, clip about that much of it so it's that long, and they, you know, get a piece of wood, put a groove in there, mount that that you know that tube inside inside that piece of wood, and then you know the locks, they put a slide lock with rubber bands, and then they hold it and just pull it back, put the bullet in there, bam, and that's how she killed that chick with the zip wow. gun. So. That's crazy, bro. Yeah. So yeah. mom was a mom was a straight gangster. She, yeah. like you said, she was an immigrant of Jewish uh, family, and and she fell in love with the Chicano lifestyle. Exactly. And she ended up living that real, I hate to say it, but that gangster lifestyle, <laughs> right? Yeah. She did time. How much time she do for that? Uh, you know, like um, I think she did like, uh, you know, back then you didn't get a lot of time for murder. Yeah. Uh, five. Five to life was a, a life sentence, or five years was a life sentence. Seven years was a life sentence, and I think she did like 10 years or whatever. But, you know, um, I finally met her when I was 14. And I was like hard, hardcore gangster, you know, just completely incorrigible. Even in juvenile hall, they kept me in the lockup unit because all I did was fight, bang, and just like, I don't give a shit about nothing, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I was raised in a, a white foster home, and, you know, I... They were abusive to us, you know, I, I had to get the hell out of there, but I joined the hood, I became a crazy gangster, you know, like, I had I had more, I felt like I had to prove, you know, because uh, mostly everybody knew me as Freddie Barker, Fred Barker, you know what I mean, like, because it was a white foster home, and I, I grew up in a white neighborhood, which was close to my barrio, you know. So, so you were you were taking on their, their last name? Yeah, they kind of like, for, didn't adopt me, you know, they kind of forced it on me, you know. I'm telling you, that you know, their thing was, we're gonna make these Mexican, we're gonna turn these Mexican kids into, uh, in, into white people. But first of all, you know, and like I said, they they uh, won, you know, foster parent of the year for taking Hispanic kids. But you know, look at I'm not that dark. You know yeah. what I mean? Why don't you get some real dark Mexicans? Take them in. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they're like, we can really squeeze this dude into the yeah, family. Like they we can won't work even think with nothing. Him, you know, he's already light enough. You know. <laughs> yeah, get over here, little Freddie Barker. <laughs> but anyway, so I'll be I pissed in, too, bro. I'm in juvenile hall, you know, and then uh, they say you got a visit, and I was like, what? A visit? And they go, you're, it, they say it's your mother, and uh, you know, your mother's here to visit you. You know, and I knew the foster mom was not going to visit me. And I went out there, you know, and I saw this young lady, you know, like she looked young. And uh, she's like, hi, you know, so it was my mom. And uh, anyway, she got me out and I went to go live with her, but she was troubled, very troubled. I'm a little confused. 
So you didn't you didn't you didn't know I mean how how long were you away from your mom? Uh from two and a half till I met her when I was fourteen. Wow. So this is when you met her. Yeah. Wow. So, so you were in foster care from two and a half? Yep. And Pops, I mean, did you know Pops in between no, that time? You know, and the thing is, uh, with him, you know, like, uh, I, I think they stayed in contact with the foster home. His thing was like, okay, my kids are, they're doing good. They're in a middle class, you know, white family. They're going to have a good upbringing. And they didn't know what was going on, what was really going on, and how we were getting beat and abused, you know. Were they, were the, the, so the Barkers were... Beating the foster kids. Us, yes. <laughs> but not their own kids, of course, right? Oh, no. They had a, their own daughter there. And, like, my sister was, like, treated like a slave. She had to serve her. Which was another the, foster kid. My sister. Oh, your sister. Yeah. How so, was your sister? From uh, your mom and your pops? Yes. She was two years older than me. So she was four. I was two. So they pushed yeah. you to the foster system together. Yeah. <sighs> so we ended then thank God for that, because, you know, I was just... Two years old, you know, my, my sister just, she took me under her wing and she was like my mother, you know, she, she nurtured me and cared for me. <sighs> We're in this abusive situation, you know, like, like we didn't, you know, we don't know what was going on. We're just little kids, you know, getting the shit beat out of us, getting treated like. But you, but what, what point in age were you at that you understood your circumstances saying, Hey, the Barkers are not my parents. My parents are somewhere else. What age was that? Yeah, so at a pretty young age, you know, they let us know that we were foster children. And uh, they always said that our parents were in the hospital, you know. And, uh, you know, my dad used to, he was an artist, so he would send paintings and stuff like that. So, so you know, uh, I didn't realize that he was actually in prison until maybe I was like 10, 11. And uh, at that time, that's when I was like standing up to to these people, you know what I mean? You had enough I, of it. Yeah, I was rebelling. You know, I was just like, no, nah, you ain't going to beat me no more. And I even stood up physically. And then uh, then I just started running away, you know. And going to the neighborhood, I joined the hood. And uh, Mexican family, the families over there were so happy to take me and my sister in, you know. And we started So, you, so your sister there. would run with you? I went and got her. Or you went and got her yeah. and said, hey, we got to go. I got a, I got a spot for us. When she told me, so, uh, you know, like uh, she was already a senior in high school and they dressed her all crazy, cut all her hair off all the time. And I used to tell her, you got to get out of there. You know, I'd go visit her. You know, if they saw me, they'd call the cops, you know. So anyways, uh, my sister, uh, I talked to my sister and she's crying, you know. And she's saying that some boy, you know, like a one of the, you know, Mexican kids from the neighborhood was walking her home and the uh, foster mom ran outside and grabbed her by the hair saying, get inside the house, you fucking little whore. You know what I mean? And and uh, when she told me that, I went over there and got her out of there. We got her clothes. I told that foster mom, stay the fuck away from me. I don't care if you call the cops. We're going. We're leaving. And I got my sister out of there. And, yeah. Sorry about the round of applause, brother. That's a pivotal moment in, in both your lives, correct? Yes. Yeah, very much so. Uh, but she was always a responsible one and always took care of me. You know, like, she got in the hood, too, you know, but she always worked. I was always going to jail. And when I get out, she'd have an apartment for me already. And she always, and, you know, rest in peace, you know, she passed away just uh, a couple of years ago. Cancer, Sorry to hear that, but, but yeah. Donuts is, uh, was, her name? Vicky. Vicky. Yeah. Vicky. Love to Vicky. She's probably looking down, watching down you, and watching you through your life if you do believe in that. Yeah. Which I do. Yeah, that's what keeps me going. 100%. Yeah. Do you mind me asking what she passed from? Cancer. Okay. From cancer. How yeah. old was she? She was uh, like 68 or 69. Okay. Yeah. So she, uh, so she, she had a, she lived a chunk of her life. Yeah, and she has, you know, five wonderful children. You know, and she turned out to be such a great mother. And, you know, after all the abuse that she suffered, you know what I mean? She uh, she turned it around and became the best mother and grandmother ever. Amazing. So. Amazing. So you you get your sister out of the foster care. 
Um, you're going in and out of the system. I mean, how how early in, in the what would you, uh, juvenile system? Yeah. And um, I mean, how was it back then in that juvenile system? Where were you at? Uh, Central Juvenile Hall. Yeah, East Lake. Or yeah, East Lake or uh, Silmar. Okay. Before it fell, you know, it fell down in the earthquake. Did it? So Did Silmar fall down? Yeah. Recently? No. Eighties. Yeah, yeah. Was it eighties? Was was the, it the Northridge one? No, no, it was way oh, before no. that. This is in the seventies, nineteen seventy one. Okay. Yeah. Well, they built that bitch back up since. Did then. they? Silmar. Yeah, Silmar. Yeah. Silmar. Yeah. yeah. Got to walk around with your hands in diamond shape, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Behind your back. Yeah. Fucking place. Um, okay. So, um, so you know, I, so we got into it. I became a crazy homeboy. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and we had our gang war going, you know, with Lomas. And uh, I was very much into that. That's all I cared about. You know, it's just like, and, uh, <clears throat> but not only were we at war with, uh, you know, the, these other vatos, you know, back then, like from 1973 to through the 80s, I mean, you know, like I got like 30, 40 dead homeboys. You know what I mean? Like once the shooting started and the drive-by started in 1973, and it started right here, Arizona, Mount Avia, the first one of the first shootings and, and murders was uh, Bobby from Arizona, and uh, the dudes from Rock Mount Avia shot him. And, you know, and it, the word got out to all the water. It was like, what? And then all of a sudden, pap, 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 everybody started copying, and it just went crazy, you know? So <clears throat> I was very involved in, in that gang conflict. But at the same time, you know, we were at war with the cops, you know? Really. Uh, I know, you know, like, um, you know, there's, little, there's things here and there that cops do, but back then, these cops were gangsters, you know what I mean? They, they they beat the shit out of you, you know? And the sheriffs, you know, like uh, Lomas had to do with the sheriffs. We had these uh, San Gabriel PD. And there was one cop in particular, his name was Billy Joe McElvain. And uh, this for the first time that I ever saw him, he pulled me over and he's like, uh, you know, he's just standing looking and the other cops, I take your, you know, empty your pockets, put your shit on the hood of the car, you know? And I put a rosary right there and he got that rosary, you know? And he's like, fucking idiot beads and he threw it on the ground you know and I was like well you don't believe in God he goes oh, I believe in God but they're idiot bees when a fucking punk ass Mexican like you was wearing them and I go fuck you and he charged me and I ran you know what I mean and the other cop was kind of in the way I don't know if he's going to try to stop him but he chased me but you can't chase me in my neighborhood because I got that whole place wired up is it go over this fence up this wall on top of this roof you know what I mean like and like within three minutes, I was like five blocks away. <laughs> and then, and that, that fool was, every time I saw him, I ran. I wasn't going to let him talk, any cop. And they were, so he was really after me. You know what I mean? And uh, <clears throat> one time he saw me, just parked the car right there, came running after me. I went, ran to the tracks. I'm running down there. I lost him. And then these other cops got me, boom. And they arrested me. They took me to jail and I was handcuffed, you know. And this fool comes in, he goes, you know what, fuck this job, man. He throws his badge and jumps over the table, starts beating the shit out of me, you know, and I'm handcuffed. You know, and they held him back and everything, you know. And <clears throat> It's funny because uh, they're arresting me, but they're like, for what are we arresting him for? <laughs> I heard of this dude's feelings or what? Because <laughs> I'm chasing him. Because I've been chasing him. Yeah. yeah. He, anyways, he came when I was in the back of the tanks. He went back there. And he's laughing at me. He goes, "I'm gonna kill you." You know, I didn't say nothing to him because he probably would. You know, you took, I, you took that as a serious threat. Yeah, very serious threat. So, um, anyways. Uh, so me and my homeboy Lefty were out night tripping one night, you know, and uh, <clears throat> we shot up a, a pad in Alhambra. We jumped in the car and we're driving away. And uh, so I'm speeding, you know, but I made it all the way to the other side of Alhambra, almost on the freeway, the 10 freeway. And uh, I crossed the you know valley 
and there was a cop, an amber cop right there, and he pulled around, pulled me over. He goes, "Why are you going so fast?" And I was like, "I was trying to catch the the yellow light, you know." <laughs> Anyways, he's like, so he's writing me a ticket. I mean, my homeboy just like, okay, so he's writing the ticket, and you know, they they uh, he took our license and he you know checked us for warrants. So on the microphone, he put that Fernando Negretti and Larry Vasquez are you know pulled over and all that. So then all of a sudden it came on the radio, his car radio, is saying, oh, there's like six shots fired, reported fired on such and such street, da 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 and he's listening, and they're calling all the cars to go, and uh, he went back to writing the ticket. So they got that call late. You know, we're on the other side of Alhambra, you know. Yeah. So we look at each other like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then uh, he was just going to let us go, <clears throat> and here comes... McElvain screeching around the corner from San Gabriel. He goes, hold on, takes out his gun, get him down. <clears throat> this is Fernando Negretti and Larry Vasquez. And he had these two cards with their names on it. Yes. They, they're known gang members. They're known to carry guns. And they're probably responsible for that shooting that just took place, you know? It's like, so back then, all they had to do was put your name on a card and say you're a gangster. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, and they start search us illegally. Well, we were guilty, but... Still, you know? Yeah. So they searched the car and found the gun. And uh, he's like, I got your ass. I got your ass. <clears throat> anyways, should I just keep going? Yeah. Yeah, 100%, going. brother. So anyways, uh, <clears throat> so he went to all my courts, you know? And um, and <clears throat> that's funny. Things were different back then, you know, the way they, they didn't just lock you up that easy, you know? And in fact, on the transcripts, uh, I had a, a lawyer friend later look at the transcript scripts of that court hearing, but McAvin was at every court just staring at me, you know, making gun things like that, you know, and like, damn. And so, so I was like, uh, but the judge actually said, she goes, I can't send this, you boys to prison. Look at you. You're so cute. I, I guess I was cute back then. <laughs> you're you know? cute now, big so dog. One Fuck of the what things they you about. lose when you get older. <laughs> Anyways, and uh, she's, so what they did, they dropped the charge from attempted murder and all that stuff, uh, shooting at an inhabited dwelling, all that, to uh, you know, discharging a firearm in a in a city limit, which was a misdemeanor. Damn! Shout out to that yeah. judge, bro. Yeah, that's so funny. When I know her last name wasn't Barker. Yeah, <laughs> it was just a, not that long ago when we pulled that transcript and saw it, and I was like, oh god, they're not gonna say act like that no more. You know, those days are long gone. Oh man, he was so pissed. He got up, you know, they, they gave me a year in YA. Okay. He got up and stormed out, which I ended up turning into three years. And that's where my, my tattoo story actually starts, you know. Um, How was it going into YA? How old were you at the time? Uh, so I was 18. You were 18. You're going and, to- you know, I should have went to prison, you know, because I was, you know, YA is for youth. But if you were up to 23 years old back then, and uh, you were arrested for a misdemeanor, they could send an adult to YA. Wow. And that's what they did with me and my homeboy. They gave us YA. So, <clears throat> but when I got to YA, you know, and, uh, you know, YA is crazy. You know, it's it's not cool and calm like prison. You know, it's just like back then all the gang wars were going on. It's just like it was trouble. <laughs> it was a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh Anyways, so I, I ended up going to Preston, Preston School of Industry, and um, uh, <clears throat> so what happened was um, I, I uh, met a telephone operator. So we would we'd make calls, you know, home, and we'd use pay phones, and uh, you know, Preston was like in a little little town up north, and the operators in Stockton, they the girls they could see if the coins were coming from Preston. And they would grab those coins so they could talk to us. So anyways, I, I met a girl like that, you know, a telephone operator. Was she fine or what? Did she, I mean, did you end up smacking that shit or what, you know? <laughs> Let him finish. <laughs> no. Uh, and, you know, she she was a nice girl. You know, she wasn't, you know, uh, Those are the ones queen, we always try to get. A beauty queen or anything like that. But I wasn't looking for that. So I was looking for somebody that I could connect with one of the guys from up there, lady, that would get weed 
and then have her bring me the weed into my visits. Uh. And so, you know, and I, I always, because I could draw and I was always outgoing, you know, I always had a juice car with the staff, you know. But I would go to my visits, you know, and I'd take a little radio with me. And I had a fingernail cutter, you know. And we'd be sitting out on the grass because of contact visits. And then she'd give me the bag and I'd unscrew my radio, you know, and then I'd stuff the bag in there and then screw it back up. And then, you know, they would, they would open the tape player and stuff like that, but they wouldn't unscrew the radio. Yeah. So <clears throat> every week I was sneaking in bags of dope like that, you know. And um, then, <clears throat> then we even got a little more ingenious, you know. So, uh, you know, there was a drug program, and it was in the middle of the institution. And uh, the drug program, you know, the, the way they, uh, you know, ran shit was uh, if, if uh, they would break you down, you know, so you would have to wear, they shave off your hair and you had to wear signs saying, I'm a punk, I'm a bitch and all this. <laughs> and that's what, and, and then they'd build you back up, you know, and uh, they would build you back to the point where they would give you authority and you would have authority over other kids in that, in that unit. So one of the guys was, uh, one of our guys had a homeboy in there that had the highest authority where he even searched the packages. So we got these girls on the outside to like steam open granola boxes and put, you know, uh, half pounds into these granola boxes and then seal them back up and then mail them into the drug program. And then the guy searching the packages would put those off to the side That's and then sealed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were sneaking pounds in, into that place and there's only like 400 people. You know, four hundred higher than a motherfucker. <laughs> oh, people, bro. There was dope everywhere. Why do and all drug programs are the spots to go hit fucking uh, <laughs> cops and shit, dog? You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyways, so uh, you made yeah, a lot of money with that. I made a ton of money because it wasn't that easy to s smuggle dope in. I mean, how would you? How would you? How would they pay you? Cash. Cash. Yeah, people could, you know, sneak cash in really easily in the visits. You know, because it's contact visits, so everybody was getting cash. And then I would get that cash and then may just stick it in an envelope. Back then they had, you know, these uh, rights where they couldn't read your letters. So you could write your letter and then seal it. And they, they had no right to open it. Anyways, so. Mail the cash out. Yeah. Yeah. And I was mailing it to my sister, you know. So, oh, bro, nice. so at, at, at 18 and did already be thinking like this, you know, I, do you believe that you were born maybe with something on the Jewish side? I don't know. I'm just saying, <laughs> uh, you know, of uh, the, the the art to just hustle or to make do of whatever's in front of you and just live the best of whatever the environment is. I mean, have you done that since a child or since you ran away from? Yeah. You know, I think uh, I was just uh, natural streetwise. Okay. You know, um, I've always, you know, took control of my situation in jails. You know, especially with uh, the staff, you know, like in the county jail, you know, I go in there, what do they, I paint murals. You know, I draw designs for the sheriffs. They give me food from the streets. They house me in a, with the paisas, you know what I mean? Like, I always had a, a, a juice cart, you know what I mean? And the homies like that, you know? Yeah. Because I could do stuff for the homies and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So I always had a good juice cart and I always had things hustling, you know, you can imagine there in YA, all that money I had, I was smoking cigars, I had, <laughs> you know what I mean? And all the homies, I had lots of friends, you know, just, Hell yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, things were going good and I was gonna get out actually in like, I had like 30 days to go. The problem was, you know, I should have stopped, of course. You had it too good there. You didn't want to go, right? Uh, I didn't care, you know, I never cared. You know, I was one of those guys, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know, I don't give a fuck. Um, but, the thing is, is that uh, I was hooked. I mean, I was really hooked. You, you know, like, I couldn't go a day without smoking. And I, I know, you know, it's not supposed to be addictive or whatever, but we were hooked. And off, we were, the, off the weed. Yeah, it yeah. was good weed, too. Yeah. For way back then, it was coming from up north there somewhere. So, so you know what I mean? Like, uh, I think when they were trying to, you know, like, nail who, who they wanted to find whoever was doing this, you know, they didn't suspect me because that girl that came to visit me, they knew she was a phone operator. She knew she, they knew she was innocent. You know, somebody told me that when my name came up, they said, no, it's not Negretti. No, <laughs> that girl is such a good girl. If she knew he smoked weed, she wouldn't be coming to visit him, you know? So I was like <laughs> off the list, you know? Yeah. 
And so anyways, uh, all of a sudden, you know, where I had all the dope was in the gym. And then uh, they closed the gym for a week. I was like, what? All the dope's in the gym. I can't get in there. So I called the girl and I told her, you know, don't don't bring nothing. You know, we'll do it the old fashioned way. Don't bring nothing on Saturday. Bring it up on Sunday. So Saturday, everything was cool. So she brought it up on Sunday. I put it in the radio and then they came and they go, Negretti, you and your visit. Come. And I was like, uh, okay. And then they're like, uh, we're told that you have weed in this radio. And I was like, no. Nah. <laughs> Anyways, they opened it up. They saw the weed and he just goes, you motherfucker. And he's fucking smashed it all over the floor. He was so pissed. And he told the girl, you get the hell out of here. You know what I mean? Like, that was a case for her. You know, that's a felony. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and <clears throat> so they were so pissed off with me that they gave me three years out of my time in Tamarack program. And um, that's where the tattooing part comes in. So Tamarack program was a lockup program in Preston. So Preston had the first YA ever. It was like this big haunted castle. Actually, it came you know, Ghost Hunters? Yeah. It came out in Ghost Hunters, you know, like... <laughs> The guy stayed overnight there, and a ghost scratched him, and they could hear him screaming. Yeah. And uh, we knew about it, you know, and everybody always thought they heard something going on. Anyways. So, so even, big, even back then, you 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 guys thought there was ghost. Yeah, we were told the first thing, everybody said that castle was haunted. It was abandoned, but it was a big castle. It was the very first YA. But in the back of the castle, in a gully, was the lockup program for discipline. Damn. And that place was like a dungeon. It was the creepiest, eeriest place ever. It was all granite. Every door was a big steel door with a little square and had little bars in it. You know what I mean? Like, Fuck, and, and there was two tiers. And uh, that was Tamarack program. And that was for the, the criminally insane youth authorities. You know, like the hopeless cases. Yeah, you know? The worst of the worst. Yeah. And what they would do is they'd send you to prison for 90-day observation. You go to Tracy Prison, K-Wing. And then... Um, they would evaluate you. If uh, if they thought that you should go to prison, they would go ahead and send you to prison, give you a B number, what back then was B number. Or they'd send you back to uh, Tamarack program, and uh, you would do your time in this little lockup. And the staff there were, they were trippers. They were crazy. But their thing was this, you know what? We'll make a deal with you guys. As long as you don't kill each other, we'll let you... You know, tattoo will bring you pornography. You know, you could lock down in somebody else's cell together, tattoo each other. You know, they gave us all these privileges that were illegal. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody's tattoo story in prison is like, and we had to watch out for the guards, you know? Yeah. Mine was like, they let us tattoo. They brought us ink. They brought us needles. And at the same time, we got the pattern how to make, you know, homemade tattoo machines. So... You know, uh, after two years, I got really good at tattooing in there. You know what I mean? With a machine, you know? Yeah, Walkman so, motor. Yeah. Pink you know, cap. The first rotaries. The first rotaries. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So anyways. And what kind of tattoos Walkman, were they getting back then? What was the what was the kind of like, was it just the same pattern being passed around? Uh, well, you know, I was drawing, you know, like, uh, you know, we did have a bunch of patterns. You know, we got patterns where we could. I drew a bunch of them. You know, but uh, so what I started doing was uh, just tattooing without a pattern, you know, like pretty much, you know, like everybody's getting skulls, hyenas, you know what I mean? Like charas, uh, you know, Aztec stuff, you know. So uh, I would just sit with the machine and just take off, you know, freestyle, you know. Oh, yeah. But I had some patterns, too, you know. So, but You think those are still circulating in the system? Since back then, it was a long time ago. But you never yeah. know, bro. You see some old ass patterns. I'm like, damn, yeah, bro, it's old you, school right here. You know, uh, those guys. It, there's guys in prison that'll break out a folder that gets passed down. You know, yeah. The, the folders will be like this thick, and inside is a bunch of tattoo stencils. You know that because you could reuse them over and over. You know, so and you know people are like, hey, let me get that pattern on me. You know that one. Yeah. So, is there any connection with you and the smile now cry later? There is. So before I went to Tamarack program, I, uh, I, I worked in the print shop. So Preston School of Industry, they had 
a trade school there. And I remember the guys in the print shop, shop were like, dude, we got to get you in the print shop, you know, because I could draw. And they're like, because uh, all we, we print in the morning and then uh, our print instructor lets us print whatever we want. And they were making little stationery and envelopes, you know, like putting borders yeah. on them, you know, like yeah. doing fancy stuff. So they got me in a print shop and I got in the camera room, you know. So I would draw designs and we'd reduce them down and put them on paper, on, excuse me, on stationary paper. And, uh, and then, you know, people would write home and say, yeah, I drew this and all that, whatever, you know. But uh, we would just print stacks and stacks of that shit. Back then, you could communicate with other prisoners, you know. And so we mailed it to all the prisons, you know, my Chara girls and and uh, and Chola girls. And and one of the designs was uh, a Smile Not Cry Later. Actually, I was looking for ideas in a magazine, and I saw an ad for a work uh, acting workshop, you know. And uh, and I saw the little comedy tragedy faces. And I right away thought of Smile Not Cry Later, the song. You know what I mean? And uh, so I drew a design. with. I made my own style of masks. And I, in fancy writing, wrote Smile Not Cry Later. And we printed it on stationery, mailed it everywhere, you know? And it just Damn. took off from there. To the point where I got, wow. when I got out. Freddie, so you, wow. you started that. You did that. Yeah, yeah, but damn, that's crazy, the, but bro. Let me see the math. Shit, <laughs> that's crazy, bro. Come on now. If you know the, the Chicano culture, the gang, LA, Southern California culture, bro, the streets, homie, that shit is just like a staple. It's a, it's a uh, man, brother. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't take credit for the masks themselves. Those this that like smile, uh, you know, that medieval comedy almost. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece, and it's always represented drama. But when I put Smile Now, Cry Later on there, all of a sudden it took on a new meaning. You know, it took on the gangster lifestyle, you know. Yeah, you're laughing right now, you're partying it up right now, but you're living hard and you're living fast, and you're going to cry later. But so what? La vida loca, you know what I mean? Shit. <laughs> so... So, and that's the meaning that it has right now. And then uh, for other people, it has another meaning. Though. It's laugh now, cry later. In other words, yeah, okay, you did your dirt. Go ahead and laugh, you know. But revenge is a mother. And uh, you're going to be crying later. You know what I mean? So, yes, it is. So that's another meaning that it took on. So, uh, yeah, so. Does that blow your mind, brother, that how it is just like that smile now, cry later pattern? Like, is it just the way it evolved in so many years that it's still here, right? Yeah. It's like an iconic, uh, what would you call it? A symbol, uh, a lifestyle type of... Uh, it represents lost. our culture. 100%. Our, so, our subculture. Our, uh, yeah, the uh, representation of the yeah, subculture. It, it totally does. And Is it a subculture and, still? Or is it just, is it still a subculture? Cause it's, still, it's still a subculture. Okay. You know, uh, you know some people... Uh, some people that are Hispanic still don't like it. You know what I mean? 100%. Uh, we don't represent uh, a, a positive lifestyle, you know, so yes, it's a subculture. Absolutely. And, uh, and, but, you know, I mean, me, I was just like a knucklehead, you know, in YA doing my thing, <laughs> you know. So it's kind of amazing that, you know, if, if none of that would have happened, who knows if Smile Not Cry Later would have ever, you know, it's been a symbol like that, you know. It's just like I had to be in the right place at the right time, doing what I did, you know. So, um, you know what, brother? It's you telling this story, and you're still you're you're a young you're a young man when you when you did the smile, not cry later. But everything that led up to that is is. You know it's crazy, bro. And you don't you don't wish that on your you know your worst enemy, so to speak, right? Right. For, for a kid to to be brought up like that, but just to understand the person that put that out into the universe, you know the the, the meaning, the death behind it, brother. What you had to go through to get to that point where you put that out, and here, it's here to this day, twenty twenty three. I mean, we got history in the building today. <laughs> this is 
fucking crazy, brother. Then that's why you are a legend. How do you feel when people call you a legend? Yeah, I don't know. I went to this tattoo shop over there, and they didn't let me in. <laughs> I was like, "Hey, don't you know who I am?" And uh, he's like, "What's your name, Freddie Mag Magretti?" <laughs> oh my God! Uh, blast that shop right now. What's the name of that shop, yeah, bro? It's that lame ass uh, shop. It's. Uh, I want to blast it, bro. Okay, tell me. Tell What's me. What's the name of that street? I'll find it. Brown Pride, Brown Pride, right there on Atlantic. Yeah, shame on you, Brown Pride, on that. <laughs> you better do your history, man. You know what, dog? And that's why you know what they ain't got the right people in that shop, bro. You know what I mean? Because check it out, there can be young dudes, bro. But there's gotta be a there's gotta be older dudes like yourself or or you know whatever, bro. That's gonna let them know where this shit came from, bro. Where it started, bro. You need to know your motherfucking history, bro. A lot of cats don't know the so. history, bro. Yeah, I, I think people, you know, uh, people should know the history. They should know uh, where it Shame all came on them, from. bro. Disrespectful. Uh, maybe as maybe fuck. I, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, you know, make anybody. All the artists over there feel bad. It was the kid that was in the front. And whoever was the, you know, they got the wrong kid in the front. Yeah, I was like, yeah. yeah. And then uh, we said, can we come in? They're like, no, not unless you're getting pierced or tattooed, you know. <laughs> and I go, well, I want to invite your shop to our tattoo convention, you know. And he goes, uh, let me see. And then he comes back out and he goes, they said to come back Tuesday. <laughs> Whoa, uh, what? They got a legend in their shop, bro. It's like the motherfucking president of fucking tattoo world walks into your shit, dog. And you stupid motherfuckers don't know. God damn it. Brown pride on Atlantic Boulevard. Somebody go pull up and let them know what they just missed out on, dog. Dumb motherfuckers, yeah. dog. And, you know, I follow them on Instagram. I was shit. proud of them. You know, it's just like, you know what you do now, right? Well, you know. Unfollow I'm, them, motherfuckers. <laughs> no, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. And uh, and and invite him again, you know. There you go, Freddie. <laughs> Smoking amazing, from a true amazing. OG right back. there, dog. Well, anyways, yeah. So, you know, uh, all that tattooing I did, and I got really good at it. Even even some of the staff, the counselors, letting me tattoo on them, you know. Damn. And uh, and I remember I used to, I used to, you know, you guys should give me a time cut, man. Just get me out of here, you know. Like, I'll get a job at a tattoo shop, you know. Like yeah. free tattoos and, for all you yeah. motherfuckers. <laughs> So they, uh, you know, they, uh, one day all of a sudden they're like, Freddie, get up. You're going to board. I was like, what? They go, yep, we're sending you to board. So get the limos ready because, uh, and I was like, oh, oh man. Shit. So they looked out. Yeah, they sent Ooh. me to board and gave me a one-year time cut. Damn, you know what brother. I mean? And, and uh, the board members are like, okay, it says right here that they have never seen, you know, uh, somebody make an improvement in their life like you. And they also say you're a great artist and they're sure that you'll be able to get a job as an artist. And Damn, bro. But Shout out to them, They didn't motherfuckers. say tattoos. Yeah, artists. Yeah. Because it was frowned upon back then, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was frowned upon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But anyways, you know, so I got out. And, uh, you know, immediately I started tattooing, you know, out of my apartment, you know. But <clears throat> at the, so after I was out for about two weeks, this Billy Joe McIlvain fool, you know? So he, he he's pissed. And he probably kept track of me, you know, when I was getting out Fuck. or whatever. So he pulled in an alley and with a shotgun blasted out his headlights on his car. And then, uh, you know, the cops, you know, he called the cops. These guys from Sangra tried to kill me, you know? And then called my parole officer and told him that I shot his car up. And my pro officer was at my house the next day, just searching it, arresting me, you know what I mean? And they actually found a gun, you know, a little handgun. But <clears throat> anyways, I, I told my pro officer, you know, when he told me, he goes, well, there's this cop that's saying that you shot at him last night. But I had the perfect alibi. I was in school, you know, like I was supposed to be. And, uh, you know, and, and he checked on it. And when he came to, you know, talk to me, I was like, I'm gonna tell you something. That cop is crazy. He's crazy, and he's out. To, he's gunning for me. And that's why I had that little gun for protection from that fool. And he goes, you know what? What you're saying makes a lot of sense because when I talked to him, I thought this guy is not right. First of all, if you're the one that shot his car up, why aren't they arresting you? Why is he coming to me? I'm just a parole officer. You know, if you committed a crime like that. 
Yeah. Why didn't they arrest you? He goes, and his he goes, his story was off. He goes, look, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to, you know, give you a 60-day violation for that gun, you know. But you should be getting a year, but I'm only going to give you 60 days, and you'll be out in a little over a month, you know. So while I was in there, Damn. this cop, he invited all these cops to, to his house for like a poker party or something. And uh, when those cops got there, you know, I got all the inside and all this shit, but when they got there, he had guns stacked up against his door. And, uh, and he was wearing a vest. And they said, well, what's up with the guns and the <clears> vest? And he's going, these Sangra guys are out to get me. Damn. They're trying to kill me, you know? And then uh, anyway, so as the party was going on, he's going, just a minute, I'm going to go take out the trash. He went outside and they heard, bam, bam. They heard gunshots. They ran out there and he's going, they got, they got me, the Sangra guys, you know? What that fool did, what? he had some, one of the sheriffs, because he was locked in with those guys, because, you know, uh, they even wrote on my homeboy's driveway, Viva los sheriffs, fuck Sangra and all that. The sheriffs did that. Damn. And, uh, <clears throat> but fortunately, you know, chopping that fool, uh, the guy missed the vest and hit him in the leg or in the groin area, you know what I mean? So, oh, shot his dick and, off? And <laughs> I'd like to think so, you know, I, I, that's how I tell the story, but I think it got him in the leg. But anyways, you know, so, and they, when they saw that he got shot, they were rushing everywhere to looking for, you know, for the Sangra guys that shot him, you know. Right after that, I got out, you know. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of the homeboys knew my, my beef with this cop. And uh, my homeboy, Eddie, called me up and he's going, dude, McIlvain is following my little brother, David. And I was like, he's, he's been, you know, like stalking him. I was going, dude, tell David to stay the fuck away from that guy. If he sees him, run. Get the hell away from him. He's crazy. He's not even a cop right now because he was on medical leave. <clears throat> so anyways, so a couple of days later, I'm tattooing in my apartment and all the homeboys are there. And then all of a sudden it comes out on the, on the news. It's big thing there. Hey, look at this. And they're saying... Two, two members of the notorious Sangro gang have kidnapped and are holding hostage Billy Joel McIlvain from San Gabriel PD in this house. And, and uh, it was like a three-hour ordeal. And, you know, he fired like over 100 rounds out of the window. And it was on all the national news, you know. And, and we're like, what, what Sangro guys? You know what I mean? What? They're all right here. <laughs> yeah, we're right here. You know what I mean? Like, and... Uh, <clears throat> That fool, he arrested my little homeboy, David Dominguez, handcuffed him, took him to his house with a gun to his head, told his wife, call the police and tell him right now that I'm being held hostage by two members of the Sangra gang. And his wife went ahead and did it. She later testified against him, but she went ahead and did it, you know. So after the three-hour ordeal, he came stumbling out and he's going, I got him. I got him with a, a gun I had in my my shoe, my sock. And uh, anyway, and they cheered him like a hero, you know, and they went in there and uh, they saw my homeboy was blasted up, you know, six times with a 357, you know, three times with a 12 gauge shotgun. And right away, the coroner went in there with, you know, some needle they put in your kidney. And they're like, he's been dead over three hours. You know what I mean? That fool kidnapped my homeboy and murdered him. Yeah. And, uh, and they got him. They got him. They got him for murder. First degree murder. For that. For that. But within 10 years, the police union, the media, even the governor of California back then, and that actor Hutch, because they used to call the cop Hutch, from Starsky and Hutch. Yeah. They went to bat for him on an appeal, and they got him out. How long did he do? It ten, years. Oh, ten years. What year was it? This is, uh, <clears throat> you know, 1977. Damn. It was a big story. And, uh, you know, it was a dark, real dark time for my hood. And my homeboy's family, they're still suffering. His mom is still, you know, still doing it, trying to get, you know, lawsuits, all that stuff, you know. Um, 
It's been a terrible ordeal. So uh, myself, you know, it's a big part of my story, my book, and myself and and uh, Luis Rodriguez, who's, uh, you know, he was from Lomas. You know, he wrote Always Running. A lot of people know that book. So we wrote a script about it. Wow. Yeah. Well, you go, to, you're gonna pitch it, pitch it to somebody. Somebody, huh? You know, we give it to, we gave it to some people already. You know, some of the homies, Danny Trejo, and some of the other. You know, we want it to be a Rasa thing. You know, and um, that'd be dope, brother. And, I mean, how do you feel about the other movies that have come out? That like you said, you were part of Blood and Blood Out. Did yeah. you do some stuff on Blood and Blood Out? Yeah, I did all the tattoos and all the artwork, and that was the first you know movie uh, that I did you know tattoos for. I went on to do like 30 some features, you know, it's just, but blood in blood out was the first one. And, uh, you know, and I had a little talking part in there, you know, I was the guy, uh, in the tire scene saying, gee, go, you know, I'm just doing this for my wife and kids. Eh? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Popeye's clipping us for a third of our check. <laughs> How was that set? Oh, it was great. It was great. You know, and at the same time, you know, Eddie Olmos and, and them were, were doing their movie, right? American Me. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people like that movie, but nobody, not like Blood In, Blood Out. You know, uh, and, and Blood In, Blood Out was, uh, it was kind of like the Hollywood version, you know? They cha- they made their own, you know, the, it wasn't Mexican Mafia, it was La Onda, you know? And, and, uh, and, and they did, you know, like, um, they didn't expose all kinds of, Things like Eddie almost did in his movie, and and you know, and what he did, a lot of the stuff he did was not good, you know. But a couple of people got killed, you know. Uh, one of the homeboys got killed, and and uh, some woman, you know, who was a social worker, uh, killed. You know, it was a big mess. They even came to. I remember uh, they came to our set, you know, when we were shooting, and did a drive by on our set. <laughs> You know, and because it was a, a set of another movie you're doing. We were doing Blood In, Blood Out. Okay, at and that they time. were doing American Me. So that was that was simultaneously. Yeah. So happening. while we were filming, they came and did a drive-by on our on our set and shot yeah. the catering guy. Oh fuck! And, <laughs> <laughs> so the the thing with uh, you know uh, American Me, you know Blood In, Blood Out, they casted you know um, Eddie Olmos to play the. Um, you know, Montana character in yeah. Blood and Blood. Have you seen Blood and Blood? Out? Yeah, it's okay. been a long time, though. <laughs> oh, you need a refresher. You need a refresher. No, I'm going to do a refresher, brother. 100% <laughs> after this, because I got to catch you at that tire scene. Well, they're doing an anniversary, a Blood in Blood Out anniversary coming. Oh, man. Maybe somebody could look it up. Yeah, in case you look it up. It's a 30 year anniversary. Uh, it's going to be at Plaza de la Raza. They're going to be showing the movie, and a lot of the stars are going to be there. I'm going to be there. With some of the tattoos I did, you know. And I should have been prepared with the. Was it? Was it? Was that a good paying gig right there for you? Yeah, yeah, very good. All those movies I did were very good paying. You know, <laughs> like my partner, his name was Freddie Blau. He's the one that invented that makeup. You know, that, to do temporary tattoos with, and um, and he got all the all of a sudden after Blood and Blood out all these productions wanted tattoos, you know, for their movies like Blade and Con Air and just yeah. like Wild Palms. Just, I can go on and on, you know, like. That you, and, that you, they hired you for that. You yeah, were the I go-to guy. You were the go-to guy. I was the day. only guy because, oh. because uh, my partner, Freddie Blau, was the chairman of the board, the IA union. Uh. He was the chairman of the board and he made sure that I was the only tattoo artist that could be a TA, a working TA. A TA is technical advisor, but sometimes they need the techno technical advisor to actually do work on you know on the film. So, so you know uh, that that was another part of my story. You know all the movies I did. You know fun. what's kind of crazy, bro, is dudes that have done time and have gotten out, done a, you know a nice stretch of time that you can be consultants on movies now. Yeah, I didn't know there was a there was a role for and that, actors, bro. And actors, and actors, well, of course, and actors too. Mm-hmm, yeah. You know. Especially if you're tatted down, you know who you're going to be. You're going to be the bad guy, dog. You know what I mean? Right. I, I feel bad for some of the homies that get into the acting world, bro, and they're just sleeved the fuck up, bro. And it's kind of like, 
you know, they're just going to be, I, I, and I hate to say it like this, but like a one trick pony, right? It's like a character you, you, role. Yeah, you're just a character role, 100%. You're yeah. just this, you know? And, and you know, it's, it's probably harder to rise up in the industry when you're just, you can only play this one character, even though there's been a couple that have, you know, made a little bit of noise, right? Yeah. Hey, if I could say the Blood In, Blood Out 30 year anniversary is uh, Saturday, April 29th um, at Plaza de la Raza. And that's at Lincoln Park. Yes, in Lincoln Park. Yes. I and it's going to be great. Yeah. My buddy's uh, mom's actually like uh, like the president of the of that whole... Uh, of the plaza? Yeah, of the plaza. Yeah. And I just found this, out, found this out like one week ago. So I probably know her because we used to do our show over there, Tatuaje. Her last name is Torres. Miss Torres. Yeah. I'm not good with names. <laughs> <laughs> My name's but, well. uh, the head lady over there. Yeah. I, I worked with her all the time. That that's a good venue, man. It's so it's got the theater. Have you ever been there? No. It it's it's a plaza, you know. And uh, we did art shows there, so there's a big room for, uh, you know, like, to for art gallery. There's a big plaza with a stage, music. There's a big gym, you know, and uh, then there's a theater. You know, it's a great place to do, you know, shows. Yeah, you know, oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. But anyways, so right there, Lincoln Heights too, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty active right there, you know. Yeah. Blood in, blood out. Yeah, no anniversary. Yeah, you know what I mean? Everybody gang, every gang member in the neighborhood gonna be there, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it should be all right, you know. Like uh, the twenty fifth uh, anniversary was at Alvera Street, and there was a gang of homies there, you know. And we watched that movie all night long. Yeah, you know? I couldn't even take it anymore. We had to go. <laughs> <laughs> No, 100%. But the director, Taylor Hackford, was there. He was going to stay up all night and watch it. So it, it's, it's fun anyways. No. Uh, so that that was the thing between American Me and Blood In, Blood Out, you know. Like, Got a little bit of that, the backlash of that. Yeah, yeah. Probably had to so, talk to some people and be like, no, nah, this shit ain't over here. Yeah, I just, I, I liked uh, Blood In, Blood Out, not just because I worked on it. I did all the tattoos on it and I acted in it. But when they first approached me about the whole thing, I thought it would be better to be a fiction the way it was. Yeah, so, and uh, the Rasa wins, you know what I mean? Yeah, in, yeah. In Blood In, Blood Out. And I really like that, you know? Absolutely. So, hey, we, gotta, we gotta win sometime, baby. We gotta win. Yeah, yeah. we gotta win. Yeah, we're not always gonna be the bad guy. 100%, brother. 100%. <laughs> so, anyways. Yeah, so, you know, I started tat, you know, after all that, I started tattooing my apartment. And, uh, you know, do my best work, you know, with the prison machines and all that stuff. And my sister had the apartment for me, you know, so it was sometimes annoying for her because I'd have all these homies coming and I'd be tattooing, you know. <laughs> but at that very same time, uh, Good Time Charlie, Jack Rudy, Creeper, and Lady Blue opened up a tattoo shop right here on Witter Boulevard, you know, uh, and, and Finley, you know. And... Uh, it's Good Time Charlie's, it was called. And, <clears throat> you know, Jack, Jack Rudy, Wero, you know, he uh, he's white, but, you know, he, he was raised in a Mexican foster home, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, he grew up in the culture. He was uh, less about gang banging because he was uh, from Ochentas, and he was less about that part of the culture that I was a part of and more about the cars and the clothes and yeah, the he's, art you he's wanted to fuck all the bitches big dog <laughs> <laughs> Say it, <buddy>. yeah <laughs> so anyways he you know uh so he inspired you know good time charlie who was working at the pike to open up this tattoo shop in east l.a because he's saying hey everybody over there they want their tattoos with no color they want them to look like they're in prison you know what i mean and uh and just like no color, that's like half the tattoo. It's not, though, because you got to do the shading. But, you know, so they opened up Good Time Charlie's in East L.A., and they were doing some nice work, really nice work. And I remember people would come to my apartment and say, hey, I got this from Wero, you know? And I was like, whoa, that's like prison art on steroids, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, uh, you know, because they had the equipment. And I, I do a tattoo, and I say, go over there and show them my tattoo. So <clears throat> Jack was really you know, interested in my work. And uh, so he sent word. Somebody said, hey, Jack wants to talk to you. You know, he wants you to go to the shop. So I thought, oh, shoot, maybe I'll get a job, you know. And so, you know, I, 
I put all my artwork and a folder and everything. And I went down there and I met Jack and we were looking at all his work and they had my designs on the wall, my smile, not cry later. And, oh, shit. and, and uh, my child out girls and stuff. And I was like, Oh dude, those are my designs. He's <laughs> going, man, everybody says that. It's like, everybody comes in here saying, Oh, my cousin drew that. My uncle did that in prison. Because when, every time somebody would write a letter, they say, hey, me, I drew this. You know what I mean? And it was the shit that was being printed. <laughs> yeah, it was a printed shit. Or they had the homie drawing. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I go, nah. And I busted out the originals, you know? So, Damn. So me and Jack hit it off really good, you know? Fuck yeah. And uh, he, you know. Finally, a dude with receipts shows up to his <laughs> fucking shop, dog. You know what I mean? Got anyway, the receipts, baby. And, you know, he didn't offer me, they didn't offer me a job. Uh, Charlie and them didn't really talk to me. Charlie's cool. He's my friend. Good friend. He's the founding father of the whole thing. You know, good time, Charlie. Um, and we became really good friends later. But at that time, they didn't really give me the time of day. But Jack Weddle did. He was like, oh, he was, dude, we need to keep in touch. You know, send your people down. I want to see what you're doing. You know, he wanted to see what designs I was doing. You know, it's just uh -huh. like. Was it a competition? Was it a competition thing with the other artists right there, maybe? Um. <clears throat> You know, maybe once we were working together, yeah. we had a friendly comp competition going on. But I, I think he was just interested in the fact that there was a original somebody from out of jail doing, doing it the way it's done originally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and, and so uh, these dudes weren't hadn't done time or anything. No. Okay. No. All right. But they started. They were learning. They, they would. You know, Jack grew up in the culture, so he knew the imagery. You know what I mean? And. uh and he invented the single needle for a professional tattoo machine. He knew about fine lines and, and shading and you know what I mean? And he was a great artist. So he was making it happen. That's for sure. And, uh, and making it look good because, you know, the shading, I used to be like, look at all that shading. How's he doing that? You know, yeah. it's because they were using multiple, you know, seven mags and, you know. So anyways, I went back to doing what I was doing. So apparently not long after that, Good Time Charlie became a Christian, you know and decided he was going to not tattoo anymore. And it kind of left Jack and them in, in, in kind of a mess because there's some crooked people out there, tattoo people, that would like to come in and swoop that up. He wanted to sell the shop. and But one of the good people was Ed Hardy. And Ed Hardy is like, um, he's the main man when it comes to tattooing. This man is, you know, he's a college-educated, fantastic artist, that went to Japan to learn that style, introduced Japanese tattooing to America, um, you know, uh, made traditional style tattooing. Um, Named them. Yeah, yeah, you know. And he, he, um, he first saw black and gray tattooing from Charlie and Jack at a tattoo convention, and it blew his mind. I was like, this is something, this is something different. I've never seen anything like this before. He went down to East LA and got tattooed himself by Jack. And, uh, you know, he loved it. But when he saw that Charlie was going to sell the tattoo shop, he said, oh, hell no. He bought it. Okay. So he uh -huh. bought the tattoo shop. And then Jack told him about me. And Ed, Ed wasn't, you know, like a biker type, you know. He's like an artist, artsy guy, you know. Like, uh, he's going, we got to get this guy Freddie in here to not only because of his work, but to relate to these people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he's one of them. We got him. We got to get him in here. You know what I mean? Smart man. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Jack said word. Hey, Freddie, come down. I went down there. He goes, yeah. So he goes, bring a homeboy, you know? And uh, so I went down there to do a tattoo, you know? And I did one of my freestyle tattoos without a pattern. You know, I did like a, a girl on this guy. And he's like, whoa, we never saw that before. You know, that's it. I was showing out a little bit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got him, baby. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So, and I got the job, and he wanted me to do a two-week apprenticeship. Uh, but the other guy that was working there, I don't, you know, it's like um, all tattoo shops at that time were run by bi bikers. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't too happy about a cholo gangster coming in to work. You know what I mean? Like, they were never going to give any of us a, a job at any tattoo shop anywhere. Because were they the majority that had the shops at the time? They owned all the shops. They owned all the shops. Yeah. Okay. It pretty much so Why turned. is that, though? Why? Why is that? Um... You know, uh, yeah, you know, it's hard, hard to say. You know, they're bikers. Bikers are very much into tattoos, you know, mostly 
color and traditional style tattoos, you know, but um, I, I think uh, that if you weren't a biker, when you got a job at a tattoo shop, you became one. You okay. know what I mean? That's like. But why know, was it bikers hmm. and there wasn't homies that were, you know, because they well, opened up the shops? Yeah. You know what? Because we were gangsters. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's privilege, you know. Yeah. It was white privilege. <laughs> yeah, know. who knows? You know what I mean? Like, Most likely. They, they, uh, they had the money. They had the, the money. They were yeah. able to get the you loans. Know? Right. And and they, some, they the old uh, tattoo shops that had been in L.A. for years and years was passed on by certain people, families. And mm. you know what I mean? How like, long has tattoos been around for? Uh, well, the first tattoo person they found was 5,000 B.C., the Iceman. <laughs> <laughs> but uh if you're talking about more recent <laughs> in los angeles let's say yeah and they got him out of the brea tar pit <laughs> <laughs> he had a little chiseled piece on him <laughs> anyway now cry later <clears throat> but you know that's true tattooing is ancient okay then that, that i just threw that out there for no i know but I uh, it. I was profe like, right, professional dog got tattoo the jokes uh, professional tattooing, you know, like, uh, you know, w when uh, when the sailors, you know, uh, were in contact with Polynesia and Samoa and all the Hawaii, everywhere they were going, you know, they saw that they were tattooing, doing their tata. And um, I think, you know, they were the first ones to really get attached to this tattooing. It was something big for them to go to an exotic place and get one of their tattoos and even royalty and and sophisticated people would go on these long journeys to Samoa or somewhere <clears throat> to get a tattoo you know what I mean and I think that's why a lot of the first tattooers were called sailors Jerry or sailors mm. you know what I mean like, yeah I see that it was very much a navy thing you know so so it says that Martin uh, Hildebrandt set up a permanent tattoo shop in New York City in 1846 okay and he was tattooing sailors and uh, military servicemen from both sides of the Civil War. Maybe, maybe, you know, like the person that's claiming it uh, right now is uh, Carrie Barba. She owns the original Cliff Raven. I'm uh, not Cliff Raven. Uh, um, Burt Grimm's. Thank you. Uh, she owns the original Burt Grimm's, which she claims was the very first tattoo shop in the United States. But I have heard of this other guy, but basically it's going back. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that's pretty you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, and, and that's where it came from, was the, uh, the Polynesian the, Islands. And then the homies adopted adopted the tattoo thing and right. created the Chicano style, gangster style, whatever you want to call it, and you were one yeah, of those men. exactly. So, I mean, you know, with uh, the homies in prison before the machines, <clears throat> they used to hand poke, you know? And even back then, they hated color. They didn't want any color. They didn't want their tattoos to look like they were done in a tattoo shop. Or to maybe look like bikers, right? Totally not like bikers, yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean, but I'm, I'm just talking in regards to, like, color. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, you know, eventually, you know, the, all the bikers took on the black and gray also. Their imagery was a little different. It was like wizards and... You know things like that. Dragons. Dragons, and you know, like flying, goblins, fly, flying dildos. <laughs> My dad has like, this goblin chick with a big set of tits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I always looked at that when I was growing up. Like, what the sure fuck is not a, that? Dude? You sure, it's just not a fucked up portrait of your mom. For? <laughs> 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 I've seen some dudes with some fucked up portraits, bro, looking like some goblin bitches. I've seen some yeah. fucked up peacocks. Yeah, I mean, I got my peacock. You know that. Like, so the you know the the homies like uh, in my neighborhood we had some some good tattooers prison tattooers and uh, my homeboy Ta Tarzan and Little Man and Bunky and when they got out of prison they saw the hand poke stuff I was doing they taught me how to do you know the the prison style with a guitar string and using two needles and it was called skin popping I don't know why but well I do know why because you go in kind of sideways and then you pop it up yeah and you go t -t 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 -t. yeah. It's kind of like how the Japanese do their Tadori, you know, thing. Yeah, no, it's so. crazy, bro. And I've seen some in the in L.A. County Jail. I actually got a 68 on my stomach. Um, one of the homies, we thought it was, I thought it was a good idea to put a 68 on right there, whatever. 
Um, and it was with, a, a, I believe it was a paper clip, maybe sharpened paper yeah. clip, you know. Or a staple. Yeah, a staple. Yeah, no, it was a staple on a pencil with some fucking string fucking wrapped up on it <laughs> yeah. to, to hold yeah. the ink, dog. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, brother. Um, but I've seen dudes in L.A. County Jail, bro, do some crazy portraits on skin with that motherfucker, bro. Yeah. All hand poking. That's yeah. nuts, bro. I mean, I did, you know, before I started tattooing with that homemade machine, I, I did some big elaborate tattoos with the hand poking. You know, it's just, that was my thing, hand poking. You got to really yeah. love the art of tattooing for you to do a big, some big pieces with hand poking. Bro, that is, how long does that take compared to using a fucking Walkman motor <laughs> machine? Hours, hours, That's yeah. fucking, so you got to be really in love and dedicated, in love with the art. Like you've always been in love with the art. Yes. It, it was mm -hmm. how. What age were you? Where you were felt like, hey man, I'm fucked. My my strike comes on the wall is way better than everybody else. I mean, when did you realize that you had the gift to draw? Well, you know, uh, that was like second grade. You know? Second grade. Yeah. So, um, what were, my, you, what my, were you drawing in second grade? Oh, uh, whatever they had me drawing in in art class. I remember I did a cow. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, they had a bust of George Washington. I did a George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, the, whenever we had art class and the teacher would be like, he has talent, you know, he could draw. To me, I don't know, it's just like, I was just drawing what, what you said to draw, you know, but you know, that art ability I got from my father, he's a great artist, you know, and my uncles were all great artists. Wow. My father was a prison tattoo artist. And he was also, you know, uh, a good oil painter like, uh, when we were in the foster home, you know, like from prison, he we sent our kindergarten pictures to the hospital where it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, it's like, and uh, and he sent these amazing paintings of portraits of us, you know. So, so I, I took this, you know, I got his art ability, and uh, they recognized it early when I was a kid, you know, and and um, you know. I was even in the gifted class for a minute, but I was too bad of a kid, you know. They kicked me out of there. But um, when I first, like, really fell in love with tattooing and, and the culture and everything was uh, when I had rebelled, you know, I was running away from home. And um, when I first ran away, I went to the beach, you know. And there was all kinds of hippies there and everything. But anyways, I went to... They took me to Ju Orange County Juvenile Hall and then East, uh, East Lake. And, you know, I was only 12 years old at the time. And uh, they were going to let me go back home to the foster home, you know. And um, <clears throat> so I was in a holding cell waiting by myself. And they brought this kid in there, like an older kid. He was like 17. It, it, it's funny because, uh, you know, I was like, oh, my God. This guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he came in, he's all hardcore cholo and he had you know tattoos and everything and and uh and his name was buckwheat buckwheat, buckwheat from maravilla you know uh actually he was uh from lopez maravilla and and uh it's funny because later on we did time in ya to get we we became really good friends you know and I, you know i remember one time i tried to tell him this story you know i was just a little kid do you remember a little kid and he's like yeah. He didn't remember me, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyways, so there was only two of us in there. <laughs> he didn't remember, you know. But. Just, I just noticed myself in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, fucking anyways. buck, we had a big eagle. Uh. <laughs> so he's so I was this little kid, and I started asking him questions. He probably would have smacked me around if anybody else was around. He's like, "Yeah, you know, okay, kid, yeah, yeah." And I was like, "Oh, your tattoos? How do you do them? You know?" And he goes. You get a needle and wrap the red around it, melt it in a toothbrush, dip it in the India ink and just poke it in. He goes, my homeboy from prison did this and uh, did that, you know. And so he's like a 17-year-old kid, but he, you know, like he was one of the hardcore homies, you know what I mean? And that night I got out and I was in my bed and I pitched it 10. Oh, he also told me that, you know, you can use mascara too, you know, it works. So I was in my bed and I grabbed my sister's mascara I made a little tent in my bed, you know, and wrapped the needle and thread and everything. And it, oh, you can barely see it. I did this little tattoo right here. Oh, shit. I was going to write my name, but that, that was too much. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't finish it, but uh, it was at that point where I was like, oh, 
you know? This is, I gotta, I need to join the hood. I, you know, I gotta be like that, you know what I mean? I wanna be a troll or gangster, I want tattoos all over, you know what I mean? Like, that's when I made the, the switch, you know, in my life and went to San Gabriel, joined the hood. Like I said, remember the, uh, I was in there like, isn't this Fred Barker? You know, the <laughs> surfer kid? You know? <laughs> hey, we got Fred over here. <laughs> And I was like, my name's Fernando, I said, and I'm Mexican, Fernando Negrete. And nice. Anyway. Hey, Lucky, you want to yeah. uh, do an ad break right now? Let's do an ad break real quick. Let's do an ad break. Put the camera on me. So if you got these a restaurant, brother, or anything, anything, we got to pay this. Okay, cool. Let me pay these bills real quick. Um, a Kleenex. Go. I need a Kleenex. I probably got shiny shit coming out of my nose. Is it running? No, we'll get you something, brother. You look good. It looks fine, but we got we got Kleenex right there. Uh, today's podcast is brought to you by Smooth Hustle Lifestyle, street fashion inspired by music, art, and fashion. It's not just a brand. It's a lifestyle. Frankie, go ahead and put the camera on right here, sir. Um, this evening's podcast also brought to you by Origin Bakery Equipment, your one-stop shop uh, for all your bakery and restaurant equipment needs, home base to wholesale commercial bakeries, new and used. Follow them on Instagram at Origin Bakery Equipment LLC or pull up on them in the city of South Omani at uh, 10441 Rush Street. Uh, this evening's podcast is brought to you by Gutter Phenom. Gutter Phenom is a lifestyle brand that is dedicated to supporting and inspiring individuals who are determined to achieve their dreams. We believe that no matter where you come from or what you've been through, with hard work and dedication, anything is possible. A portion of their proceeds are donated to organizations that provide vocational training for proleys and scholarships for those in need of drug and alcohol treatment. All right, you guys hear me? Gutter Phenom. Dot com gutterphenom.com uh, use exclusive code hoodstocks20 and receive 20% off your order today I just want to thank everybody that is sponsoring this podcast um, you know we're growing baby we're growing we're about to hit 100,000 subscribers and, and that shit has just been a lot of hard work we didn't get it overnight and we haven't been able to do it without you guys our guest man our guest are the MVP real shit you know um, and I just want to thank you guys all Everybody, uh, and let's get back right here. We got Freddie Negretti, the motherfucking legend. Smile now, cry later. You know, I mean, brother, you have, and we talked about this before the podcast. We said, man, there's there's no way we can tell your story in in one sitting. You know, it is you have, you, you you've you've had a you've had a rough life. Is that safe to say? Uh, it's been rough, uh, you know what I mean? And uh, there's been uh, some amazing triumphs also. But if let's go back on the thread, the thread conversation, and let's then do we'll that. do some offshoots. Yeah. Basically, uh, you know, um, Ed Hardy gave me the job there at okay. the time, Charlie's. Yeah. And uh, Jack Rudy and myself, and, and he hired Kate Hellenbrand. Uh, we went on to, to really do our thing, you know, and, and, uh, Man, you know, back then we didn't make appointments, but me and Jack would show up and we'd have a long line of homies waiting to get tattooed. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, and <clears throat> and also I was in, influenced a lot by Ed Hardy's work. You know, his his Japanese stuff. A lot of the Japanese work, you know, like uh, the older stuff especially has like a lot of heavy black and gray in it, and then color. Is Ed Hardy the same dude that has a clothing brand? Yes. Yeah, that's him. Wow. John and Hardy. I just connected it. <laughs> Dude, legendary. Like Yeah, so and Wow. You know, he he uh he did that clothing thing with Christian Adige and um he actually got pretty rich because uh Christian Adige started printing his stuff on everything. Like cologne, yeah. lighters, just anything. And their original contract was uh you know, just shirts and hats. So I, Ed Hardy got paid pretty good off that, <laughs> like to I the bet. tune of thirty mil. Wow! So, yeah, his his clothing brand was huge. It was yeah. it was everywhere. That was that was an era for sure. It was yeah. popular culture at one point. Yeah, that's funny. When I got out of prison, you know, like uh, that when I I had went back to prison when I was a lot older, you know. But you know, I got out and I was uh, rolling with a homie, and then all of a sudden I saw a store and it said Ed Hardy, you know. And I had just gotten out the day before, and I was like. Dude, Ed Hardy has a shop right here? It was on Melrose. You know? <laughs> oh, shit. And then, uh, it's more than a shop. <laughs> yeah, so 
we went in there, you know, and uh, and there was all this clothes and there was some people with cameras in there doing, you know, and I was like, what the hell is this, you know? And then, you know, uh, I asked this lady, I go, does Ed, Ed Hardy work here? Does he come and work? I mean, there's nobody <laughs> tattooing or what's going on? She's like, I saw him. He was here doing, he's a little old man, you know? And she started laughing. <laughs> and uh, so then I, I, I go, well, you know, let me at least buy a couple of t-shirts, you know? She goes, okay, that'll be $300. Yeah, bro. And I was like, what? Yeah. I go, oh, let's see, I got $44. Uh, what can I get for that? <laughs> you know, I, know. I was going to say, bro, I've never like put an Ed Hardy shirt on, but maybe I couldn't afford an Ed Hardy shirt. You know, but I, it just really wasn't my style. Um, yeah. But uh, I, psh, yeah. I was younger. I got the bootlegs. I rocked the bootlegs. <laughs> of course you did, bro. You got blonde hair, bro. <laughs> really? I rocked that shit. You got bootleg hair, too, right now, bro. It's not even your fucking natural color, sir. So, yeah, so that's him. That's the Ed Hardy. The, the Ed Hardy. Wow. Still doing his thing. Lives in Hawaii. He's a good friend. You, Doesn't you, tattoo anymore. You still in know? contact with that man? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's wow. great. He's great. This man has the biggest collection of tattoo paraphernalia and art. He he owns my art, you know, like all the stuff I drew for Good Time Charlie's. He owns it. He has it in cabinets, you know. So, and how yeah. is it when the owning like owning the art, bro? Because I, you know what, I, one time I was gonna do some like I was gonna do some extra, you know, dudes get out of prison and they're like, oh fuck it, I'm gonna be an extra, right? So <laughs> I I, d I did that for like a very 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 small uh, time. And um, they would trip on the tattoos. They would be like, you, can your tattoo artist sign off on them? And I'm like, shit, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, I'll sign off on them, you know? Um, but people do own art. Yeah. Like, if you're, on a, if you're on a fucking, say you're on a TV show, and the dude's got an Ed Hardy, I'll use that for example, an Ed Hardy design on his arm, they got to cover that up because Ed Hardy can, what, sue him or something? They, yeah. you know, they think, you know what happened? This is what happened. So remember that movie? Uh, Hangover. Hangover. So they use Mike Tyson's tattoo on his face. Yeah. So right before production and release or release and all that stuff, the tattoo artist that did the tattoo uh, filed suit saying, that's my design. I designed it. And, and so therefore you had to get a release from me. You had to pay me to use it. But here's the thing. Is it yours or is it Mike's? Yeah. Who's it's on his body. Who, you know, like when you did the art, Mike bought it. You know, but Hangover didn't want to go into litigation on a thing like this. Yeah, they would have won because I think anybody that has a tattoo, that's your tattoo. If I draw something for somebody and I do it, I tattoo it on them, that's theirs. That's how I felt. You know what I mean? When they told I, I don't me that, own yeah. their tattoo. Yeah. You know, so, but because, you know, uh, they didn't want to, you know, go to have a big lengthy, they wanted to release this movie. They paid that guy out. And ever since that, Anybody that has tattoos has to get a release signed from the artist. Okay. So I sign them all the time. You know, yeah. just just sign off saying, yeah, you have permission to use my tattoo. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. That's uh, great. Charge them again. <laughs> 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 Double of what they originally. Uh, no, nah, I'm just playing. Anyway, so, yeah. So, I mean, if somebody wants, you know, wants to fight it, I think it would go for the person that owns the tattoo. That's. That's who owns it, not the artist that did it, you know, so. I agree, but I guess when it comes to Hollywood and, you know, they don't. You that know. was a check, and he rightfully got that check. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, shout out to that dude. I wonder what that check was looking like. I'm trying to yeah. find it right Seven now. figures, I'm sure. $30 million. $30 million, huh? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Damn. I wish I would have <laughs> had that idea. <laughs> What's wrong with you, brain? You why don't you have any ideas? <laughs> you gotta give, you gotta give and take, bro. You know, you yeah. gotta give and take, bro. Just like and you just said, you, I, I see the way you are, you're wired, bro. You know, mm -hmm. you said you're gonna go back to that brown pride shop and uh, invite him again. You know, if that's how you truly feel, then you know you're not gonna. There's certain people, bro, that are just trying to slip at a supermarket. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. They just that's that's just the type of person they are, bro. Me? No, I'm not. Hey, if I see a bottle that's broken in a fucking highway, I'm gonna I, if I see one of the people that worked, I'm gonna be like, hey. There's a, there's a broken bottle. It's wet right there. You know, you don't want nobody to slip. Oh, thank you. You know what I mean? But there's certain yeah. people who see that as an opportunity, bro. Right. Why get, don't I slip on this? Yeah, bro. And that's just, just that, that to me, that's just a shady business, bro. You know, yeah. I, I'm not, I don't know. It takes a certain person to do that. Uh-oh, tacos are here. Plates are here. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, you know, Ed Hardy brought something else to the game, you know, because because he was so professional. I remember going, you know, to his uh, studio. Now this is back in the '70s. You know what I mean? Like, and everybody just had tattoo shops, and you didn't make appointments. You know, it's just like you walk in, you pick a design off the wall, and that's what you get. And Ed Hardy was doing these elaborate custom d- drawings for people, and charging by the hour. And he had a private studio where you had to make appointments. All that stuff was unheard of in the tattoo world. And I remember when I first, you know, uh, went to his place, you know, and he goes, oh, well, here we are. And I was like, what, am I at the dentist? Or, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm at the doctor's, you know, like. Yeah, you're, you're used to the whole beat down sofa, got the homie laying on that <laughs> shit, or, you know. <laughs> you're yeah. used to the trap house. So, And he was up there, you know, with his publications and. And you know what I mean? Like he was lifting tattooing to another, a higher level. And I saw that and I clung to that. You know, just like, let me, any room under that wing? You know, like, yeah, 100%. Me. Show me about colors. Show me about all this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and I would go up there and I'd stay at his house. I'd work at his studio. You know, he would get me these, uh, these, <laughs> he did some of these customers that he had, you know, like, were, were not just people wanting to get tattooed all over their bodies. There was another level of it, you know, like I remember, you know, like our our uh, our, our medical equipment at, at Tattoo Land when we opened it, um, the guy that owned the medical supply company, you know, came and, and you know, and uh, it's like, oh, uh, Freddie, you want to see his tattoos, you know? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, and like, and went in the back room and he got buck naked, you know, and I was like, <laughs> oh, and he's like, oh, yeah, so I did this, lifting up his balls, you know, and he's Damn, opening up his bro. ass crack, and he had faces shooting out of his ass. And Fucking just, Ed Hardy's a freak then, huh? Like, <laughs> he's like, no, can you go in the bathroom and wipe that ass real quick? <laughs> that guy is a stinky. freak. Ed Hardy's a freak? an artist. Yeah, I mean, here's a rich guy that they're, they're masochists they love- that just enjoy that pain. You mm. know what I mean? Is that what you and, call that? Yeah, a masochist. And, and, uh, and Ed Hardy had a, a bunch of them. You know, but why would he care? He's getting paid a hundred bucks an hour. This is back in the seventies. It was like a freaky tattoo cult, huh? <laughs> was, like I'm gonna tattoo a butthole tonight. It, it was, what are you gonna do? I'm doing balls again, <laughs> third day in a row. But Those I mean, bikers are just, crazy. And, and then you know, like, and then the bizarre stuff. You know, like on the inside of his leg, there's a dragon frozen in ice. On the other side, there was a dragon in a waterfall, and just, just like. Uh, <sighs> Ed Hardy was just going off with the amazing work, you know, and just covering these guys' whole bodies. Wow. And they were loving it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was a, you know. What a time in history. Yeah. I mean, the the just the level of artists, like the mentality, just the thought process, the, the, the just being deep in the trenches of just a passion, right? Of what you love, man. It's like a drug, huh? Yeah. It, what's that called? A fetamine? Yeah. Like dopamine? Dopamine. Dopamines, baby. Didn't use some, yeah, dopamine release. <laughs> oh, 100%. And anyways, uh, Ed, Ed Hardy, you know, he really promoted me. I was, you know, I'd go up there and all of a sudden, you know, he's like, he's got camera, a camera crew, you know, and I'm standing in front of a thing and, you know, they're interviewing me and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is something else, you know. Up there in San Francisco, he was like a star. People not only knew him for his tattooing, but he was just like, this a publisher, an author, uh, you know, a great artist, you know, and he had all these, you know, had parties with all these, you know, uh, singers and movie stars and stuff showing up. It was really something different, you know. He was the epitome of a fucking artist, bro. He was the definition of a fucking true artist, like maybe like a Jim Morrison from The Doors, right? Um, yeah. You and his, say like and, an Andy Warhol. And his, and his, and his, Andy Warhol, and right? He, I mean, he chose, you know, where he could, like now he does all these crazy paintings, but he chose the human body as his canvas. And he literally turned it into a form of art. You know, and back then, people would argue with you, it's not art, you know, and we were like, it is art, you know, that was our main thing. And we wanted to get people to see that tattooing was a form of art and people did not accept it. People thought, no, it's not a form of art. And then until they started seeing stuff like what, we were doing what Ed Hardy was doing, and people started. Now, you know, if somebody said a tattoo is not an art, you'll laugh at them. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but back then it was a, a legitimate argument, and our thing was like, 
you know, a handful of us artists that were trying to raise tattooing to another level and get people to see, look, this is a form of art, you know, the, and your body is the canvas. And we're artists. We can draw, you know, and we can create, you know. And uh, so I remember, you know, like at, at uh, my first tattoo convention that I went to, Ed Hardy was always the big star at these conventions, you know. This was the fifth one. You know, so this is how early Damn. it was, you know, like, and uh, the the four before that, he always won Tattoo Artist of the Year. But so on this, uh, I in, here in East L.A., I did this big tattoo on this guy, Johnny, you know, where it's like a Virgin Mary, and I did it in black and gray. And then she had rays coming off of her hands, and I put color face, like a human face, a girl's face, all in color, and a skull, fiery skull, all in color. The background all roses in color, so it was black and gray, wow. and and uh, and color mixed together, you know. And Ed was like, oh, "I'm not gonna, I'm I'm not gonna enter this contest," you know. And and uh, you know, back then the way they did the contest was you had you had a pin a eight and a half by eleven picture of your art, and then all the artists would look at it and vote on it, you know. So I won Tattoo Artist of the Year and everything. He, he really put me out there, and all these tattooers from all over the world that never saw what we were doing, never saw black and gray. Me and Jack were like the heroes. They was like, Damn. they wanted to get tattooed by us. And so I had all these people that, that Ed, you know, set up for me to tattoo. And um, and I remember I was tattooing, and all of a sudden I heard somebody say, Fernando. I was like, Fernando? Nobody calls me Fernando. And I look up, and there's like five of the staff members members from Tamarack program. Oh shit. That that gave me the time they sent me to board and gave me the time cut. And they're like, dude, we knew you would make it, man. We knew you'd make it. You know? yeah. Bro, that is amazing, bro. Yeah. That is amazing. They 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 believed in you when they weren't supposed to, right? Right. When when it, it was probably a, a thing back then, you know, sounding the way the Hudas were on the streets, there was probably a lot of the, that type of uh uh, uh, officers in the system as well at the time, right, right. And these guys were different. Like I said, they let us, you know, they let us do whatever. It's just like, you know, the best way to do it with these hardcores is just let them do what they want. But if they kill each other, they're in trouble. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. gotta step in. <laughs> so, we gotta step in. Wow, yeah. and that 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 had to feel amazing though to see the staff walk in and just. I mean, were they ready to get a tattoo? <laughs> well, I was pretty booked up, but uh, I just thought it was uh, a couple of them I did tattoo. Damn, you bro, know, you've been man. booked up doing tattoo work since 1977. Seven. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Show. Yeah, for that show, I'm you know. Curious. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, like, it it was uh, one of those moments in my life, like uh, we talk about, and we're going to talk about some dark times, you know, too, but it's uh, one of those, you know, moments in your life where it's triumph. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, so. yeah. They let me out because they believed that I could get a job at a tattoo shop. And then they come to this convention and I'm tattoo artist of the year. You know what I mean? So let's go, baby. Let's go. It's amazing. One of those triumphs. <laughs> That's amazing, brother. And you've had a lot of triumphs, you know? I mean, you're, yeah. you're that you're that dude in the history books, brother. You know? It's st the start of this gangster shit, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, but that's sometimes right. with the gangster shit, you know, it's, you know, there's other bumps that we hit in the road, so to speak, right? That's true. Um, and for me, you know, it <clears throat> it was drugs, you know. Um, and the thing, it's funny when I was a kid, a gangster, you know, youngster, uh, I saw the older homeboys doing heroin, and and they'd be all strung out, but they didn't want to gangbang no more. In fact, they'd be fraternizing with the enemy, you know, for dope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I just wasn't into it. I, I, I just, you know, I saw some older homeboys, you know, sticking needles in their arms and stuff like that. And I was just like, that's not me. I, don't, I, don't, I have no desire for any of that. And, uh, <clears throat> but once I was tattooing and things were going good and I don't know why, but I, I always say it's because, you know, I wanted more, you know what I mean? Something more. And heroin provided more. It felt good. You know, it's just like, I feel good about my life. You know, I have a job. I don't have to rob. I don't have to steal. People respect me for my work. And 
you know, um, how much better could it be? And there's heroin. Yeah. You know? This will make it better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make it feel real, real good. You know, so and I'm sure I, it did for a long time. Yeah, and I, I struggled with it. You know, and and uh, lost relationships, and and uh, went went to jail more. And uh, my people were always, you know, like, um, you know, people I work with always struggling because. And then I, there were times I didn't really care about my art. You know, I wasn't trying to, you know, do great stuff. I was just trying to get the money to support my habit, you know? So, I mean, you know, um, even then, I, I, you know, like I went to jail, I, I did county time and all this stuff. And, and then the 92 riots, you know, I, I can go on and on and on, but yeah. let's fast forward to, to, uh, you know, when I had my shop in Santa Barbara and that was another, you know, triumphant thing for me. I mean, I was in jail. I knew about this guy, you know, uh, that had the, these shops in Santa Barbara because I would go guest artists over there, you know. But he was a jerk, you know, and he was a speed freak. He was an idiot, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and I remember they, they, uh, you know, I was communicating with them. I was like, I'm going to go over there and work, you know. And so basically when I got out, I went over there and, you know, I took his tattoo shop away, you know what I mean, kicked him out. And then I closed that shop and I had all these people, you know, that I was tattooing, professional people, you know, uh, construction guys and everything and a real estate guy. And they got me a choice building right on State Street in Santa Barbara. And all my construction guys came in and built me a sick ass shop. And I had over 3000 square feet, you know, like not only did I have the tattoo shop, but I had, you know, like a upstairs apartment and my office, which was my bedroom had a, a two-way mirror, you know, on my bed. You know, I had a canopy bed and everything. Okay. Yeah, and I'd wake up and look out the mirror, make sure my shop was open, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Nobody wanted to be in, in view of that mirror. They knew I'd be looking, you know. So. Living the dream, and, yeah, baby. It was good. It was good. But then, you know, there came that heroin, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and I, I ended up uh, losing it all, you know. And that was my life, you know. Like, I'd come up. I'd do great, I'd triumph, and I'd use drugs, and it would all fall apart. You know, when was I going to learn? You know what I mean? And, you know, being a tattoo artist, <clears throat> you know, you uh, you can you can keep a habit going. You know what I mean? Like, if you try to work a 9 to 5, and you got a Jones on your back, you know, you're doing speed and heroin and all that shit, which at that time, that's what I ended up doing both, you know? And, uh... <clears throat> You know, you, you're not going to hold that job down for long. No. But as a tattoo artist, you know what I mean? You just do your tattoos, get the money, buy your dope, da, 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 reset, start again the next day. You know what I mean? Like, and um, so, but something, something else, you know, if you don't lose your family, if you don't lose your job, if you don't lose your freedom, you're going to lose your health. Something else is going to get you. And it's going to get your health, you know, because that, that shit, all of it is killer you know what i mean it destroys your body it destroys your your life and all of a sudden i found myself <clears throat> not being able to breathe right you know and not being able to walk so I mean, I'm, we were trying to take a walk somewhere there like dude come on man i was like I, wait, I can't breathe you know and uh finally this ambulance driver you know my son called the ambulance and finally this uh you know ambulance driver that i had tattooed came up and said freddie you got to go to the hospital. Cause I was like, no hospital. I, don't, I refuse to go to the hospital, you know? So, but I couldn't breathe and I was feeling pain. And I said, okay, let's go. So it turned out that I had, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, large heart. And, uh, the way they worded it, you know, cause I told them everything was drug induced congestive heart failure. Okay. So I did this, you know, I did this to me. So, so anyways, they put me on meds and everything, but I still went back to using drugs. And, and then at that time, uh, one of the darkest things to happen in my life, my youngest son, Lorenzo, you know, Lorenzo Babe, that was his middle name, you know. It's, I love that kid. That was, that was my baby, you know. And uh, and he got shot, killed, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> man, that, that, that just almost ended me, you know what I mean? I did not know how to cope with that. 
it was just you know like uh yeah, anyways um i decided to just plunge myself into drug addiction and one of my rich friends from seattle he owned a construction company <clears throat> he had his own demons and he was trying to escape shit you know and uh and he came to where i lived in hollywood got an apartment right there and we became you know like hopeless dope fiends you know what i mean and <clears throat> i still tattooed you know and everything but you know, he had all the cash it's just like okay at three o'clock we're taking this and that you know and just like it's time for our dough you know what i mean like it was that was a miserable miserable way i was living and and i started getting really sick you know and i could feel it and um <clears throat> then i ended up getting rested getting out again <clears throat> and using again and then i got busted for possession this is back when it was a felony and <clears throat> you know when i got to the county jail the withdrawals and my heart condition got so bad that i couldn't even walk i was in a wheelchair i couldn't even breathe like i couldn't lay back you know i had to stay propped up and i was breathing like this I, <laughs> you know what i mean like and and uh and you know um i could feel my heart you know just like burr, 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 you know like it was bad the doctor i remember the doctor described he goes you know um uh your heart is just beating like this it's almost out of the cavity he goes i don't see how you can go on without a transplant and i was like that's not good news <laughs> you know how am i going to go on uh, i know they're not going to give me a, you know gangster ex parole or whatever a heart transplant you know and uh, <clears throat> so it got really bad then i had a heart attack you know and uh they they took me to the hospital and i was in the hospital the general hospital next to the county jail for about three weeks they postponed all my cases and stuff and and they put me on all these meds and they said okay we're going to send you back to the jail and lucky you know all those sheriffs that i i tattooed you know like uh as soon as they knew that i was back from the hospital instead of me going to the hospital you know county jail hospital ward they go and pick me up and take me to the paisa dorm and gave me a special bed where i could just chill right there you know and and they try to bring me food and a lot of them cops say we nurse negretti back to health you know just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, wow but, that's, that's yeah, crazy brother so i mean you know all of a sudden i realized i remember i told my son i didn't want anybody to come and visit me because i was all skinny and i looked gray and i i was certain beyond a doubt that i was going to die then i had another attack went back to the hospital again for three weeks and they sent me back again and i i still i still couldn't breathe you know like I could barely walk you know i was mainly in a wheelchair you know and then uh <clears throat> you know uh i remember this story from uh the bible because you know uh, i didn't get into you know when i went to college and stuff but i remember this story about this king who uh who sinned or something against god and god sent a prophet to him and the prophet told him you know what your time is up you know get your affairs in order because you're going to die and then the king said decided he was going to go to god and talk to god himself you know and bypass the, you, you had to go through prophets back then so he went to the temple and he told god god i'm just asking you for a little more time and god gave him 15 more years <laughs> and so I remember that story and I was like, you know what? I just want to talk to God, you know, and not just a prayer, you know, and we always pray when we're in trouble and everything, you know, and I have Christian background, all that stuff. So I want to talk to God, you know, and I need to be somewhere where I could be alone, you know? And I remember, you know, in the county jail, there's like a little stair flight to get up to where the showers are and there's nobody up there. So I was climbing those stairs and it took me like a half an hour to get to the top. And I just said, God, you know what? I I can't make any promises because every promise I've ever made, I, I've broken. And I can't say I'm going to do good or, or anything. But I'm just asking you, please, for a little more time so that I don't die in this wretched county jail, so that I can have a chance to be a, an example to my boys. 
so I can, you know, redeem myself. You know, I don't want to die a failure like this, you know, like uh, uh, from, you know, just please more time, you know. And then I made it down and I felt good about that prayer, you know, but the next morning I had a heart attack <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're taking me to the hospital. I always say, you know, it was like I heard back from God. It was just like request denied. You know? Well, maybe you're making a deal <laughs> with the devil. <laughs> no, it was God I talked to. Him. <laughs> Ooh, I'm just saying. Ooh, that's a good POV right there. Logan. Yeah. But, you know, so so anyways, uh, when they were taking me to the hospital, it's like all of a sudden I, you know, uh, be, because the, the ambulance drivers tell me, he goes, you know what? Whenever you want to go to the hospital, you're the one person that I've seen that has a legitimate reason to go to the hospital. And they're giving me nitroglycerin and you know, putting the IVs in there. and Taking everything. care of you. Yeah, yeah, and because that was the third time he took me to the hospital, and I all of a sudden I felt different. I, I told him, you know what? When I get out, I want you to go to Shamrock Tattoo, and I'm gonna give you a free tattoo. He goes, "You bet, buddy. You bet. I'll be there." Yeah. But something happened inside of me, where that whole time that I was in there, I was certain that I was gonna die. I was certain, but now all of a sudden I was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna live. I believe I'm gonna live." You know. And I remember I went, I went to the hospital and I got all the meds. They did the same thing. I was in there for three weeks. I went back to the jail and then I started getting better. You know, once I went back to the jail, mm. I started eating better. I could lay down for a little while. And each day I got better and better to the point where I went out on the roof and played a little basketball. I started doing push-ups, you know, and every Tuesday they take me back to the hospital and they check me, you know? And uh, so after a few weeks, I went back to the hospital and I was telling the doctor, yeah, so when I was doing the push-ups, he goes, you do push-ups? And I was like, yeah. He goes, how many push-ups can you do? I, go, I started with five, but, you know, I'm up to like 20, 30 push-ups, you know? And he goes, let me see you do some push-ups. And I got down, I started busting out some push-ups. He goes, this is really something, you know? He's listening to my heart. He goes, I'm going to have you come back next week, and we're going to redo all the tests, the echogram and all the heart tests to, you know, uh, like there's this dye that they shoot in you and stuff like that. So... <clears throat> The next week I came back, they ran all those tests. And then the following week after that, I went back and there was a group of doctors in there, you know, and each one is listening to my heart, taking turns, looking at charts and all this stuff. <clears throat> and then when they left, that doctor, oh, you know, got to excuse all my colleagues, you know, because we've, we've uh, heard of, uh, we've all heard of people's hearts, you know, uh, being repaired like this, you know, um, but we've never seen it, you know. He goes, now, let me show you. Basically, he starts showing me on the chart. Your heart was enlarged so much that it was coming out of the cavity. And it was beating erratically like this. And you were not getting any oxygen to your body. Your lungs were in failure. Your livers were in failure. And your kidney, kidneys were all in failure. And, <clears throat> oh, now you tell me? Thanks. <laughs> Damn. Nobody said a word, you know, up until then. And he goes, now... He goes, your heart is actually strong. He goes, and when a heart has damage, it usually, you know, we can give you medication, try to make a cushion for it, but it doesn't reverse itself, you know, very seldom, you know. And uh, he goes, but your, you know, your heart was beating at under 10%. You know, the, the, you don't go any lower than that. And now it's beating at 30% and 30% to 70% is normal. And I was like, you know uh -huh. what? I think God, you know, healed my heart and gave me more time for my life. You know, I thought about my prayer and he's like, well, I think that your heart healed your heart and your body gave you more time. I'm like, whatever, dude. Scientologist you know, I, or whatever you call them, bro. You know? Asshole, that's what it is. Yeah. But you know what? Well, some people just believe in science and maybe yeah. the, those, a lot of, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I mean, but that's an amazing miracle that is documented. You know what I mean? Uh, with, in my hospital reports. And now it's documented right here on Hoodstocks, baby. Yeah. That shit's amazing. You're giving me chills, bro, when you're telling that shit, man. Uh, so, uh, and that's been, uh, you know, 16 years, so. That was 16 years ago? Yeah, so I know I got more than 15 years like that game. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, you know, was... right on the 15th year, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we want to come outside, huh? Like, year 15, man. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, you like, uh, this looks too cloudy out there. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, when I said that prayer, I knew in my heart, not only, not when I said the prayer, 
uh, I, I didn't I, I didn't feel confident about getting healed or anything. You know, you ask God for a healing, you know, a miracle. You don't really expect it to happen. But I, I feel like, you know, you, with faith, you can make anything happen. You know, uh, faith is a, an amazing, you know, like Jesus said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be uprooted and be thrown into the sea. A mustard seed is like that big, you know. And I, I, I feel like I didn't have that kind of faith. Did I, when I prayed, did I believe God was going to heal me? Hell no, I, I did not. But when I got that faith, for some reason, was in that ambulance on the way to the hospital, all of a sudden, boom, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm in the middle of having a heart attack. Well, maybe and, maybe the, the dudes in the ambulance, uh, they were angels, right? Maybe, or you maybe know? God yeah. gave I mean, me They the, just needed to put, your, put their hand on you. Maybe God sent them, right? Yeah. You know? And hey, maybe go, go they put your hands on this something. man right here, this young man, this this man, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I I believe that we don't have the faith sometimes to, you know, to see big things happen, you know. But uh, I think that faith is also a gift. It's also a gift that comes from God, you know. I believe so. And that's that's what happened for me. So, anyways, well, you but always, I knew when I prayed, I was never going to use again. For some reason, I knew that I would never ever use again. And, um, and you haven't. And I haven't. Congratulations, brother. Yeah. Congratulations. I went to a, I went to a Jewish rehab. Okay. Yeah. So as so you not, should. <laughs> you know, it's better than going to a Mexican rehab, bro. You gotta go hit the Jewish side, bro. Shit. <laughs> well, you know that was the thing. So like, like, uh, you know, uh, I, I painted these murals for this captain. You know that he just rest in peace. He just passed away three days ago. But you know, I. I painted murals in county jail, you know, and I, I was looking at uh, another four years, you know, because I violated my parole and I got caught for another possession. So after my heart healed, you know, they're saying, okay, we could resume you going back to court. And then, you know, I was telling the public defender, she's saying, look it, they're going to give you two years. Just take it. And I was like, no, I want to go to rehab. She goes, they're not going to give you rehab. She goes, just take the two years. Otherwise you're going to get four years. You have no case. You were on probation. They had every right to search you. You have no case. So if you say no, you're just saying, give me four years when you can just do two. And I said, you know what, just, what if I get a letter from a sergeant? She goes, they don't write letters for inmates. And I was like. All of a sudden, a tatted up sergeant walks in. <laughs> I go, you know what, just, just give me two more weeks. And, you know, I remember, you know, one of the things after I painted the murals uh, in there, that captain had brought in these box cars and uh and he you know because it was some program they had for kids and i pinstriped them and i put the kids names on them and stuff it was a special favor i did for him for food and uh, that's and a letter yeah well food goes a long way in, no, 100%, <laughs> but yeah, that was a thing so i told the sergeant hey do you think you know the the captain would write a letter for me you know i want to try to go to rehab i don't want to go back to prison it's not going to do anything for me uh, and um She's going, oh, well, you know, we have a strict policy about that. And I go, well, do you think, you know, he'll at least talk to me? I'll see if he'll talk to me. But he never talked to me. So when I went back to court, I was going, oh, okay, I'm going to take the two years. Yeah. And uh, my public defender came back and said, well, I don't know what you did. <laughs> But the judge went in there and pulled your file and said, this guy's going to rehab. Oh, oh. shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! Pinstripes, baby. Damn. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the thing. You know, I knew I was never going to use again, but I had to learn how. You know, how am I not going to use again? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I really wanted to go to this, uh, this uh, rehab. Uh, like I said, it was a Jewish rehab. It was uh, this friend of ours that we knew that uh, was Mr. Cool. He was a Jewish guy, but we didn't know he was a head therapist at a Jewish rehab. And and uh, he told Mark, he's like, isn't Freddie's mom Jewish? And he's like, yeah. He goes, well, we can get him in this program, <laughs> you know, easy. Yeah. They take other people, they take Mexicans, they take Catholics, and, you know, too. All of a sudden, a little tatted up <laughs> fool comes up with a fucking hamaka. <laughs> <and shit. laughs> <Yamaka. laughs> well, you know, it, so that was part of my, my, you know, my journey, you know, like, uh, you know, if you know anything about AA, you know, it's uh, you begin to believe and rely on a higher power, you know. And so my mother was Jewish. So I'm in this rehab and we had to, you know, acknowledge Judaism and and do the Shabbat and all that stuff. And uh, 
Uh, my favorite was was uh, when they take the Torah. They have a tabernacle, and they take the Torah out. It's like these two big scrolls, and uh, and the guy has this cloak on, and he goes. They go dancing through the aisles, and everybody's touching it and kissing yeah. it. You know? <laughs> you, have you seen those videos where they dub like hip hop songs over those dudes? Oh, dude? oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, dude, they're going they, wild in there. And it, yeah, they do. Yeah, they yeah. really do. Anyways, so you know. Um, you know, I, the spiritual aspect, I didn't take right away, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I started my life over again with a new focus, a new love for tattooing, a new focus, you know, on my life and beginning a journey, a spiritual journey that with God, you know, it wasn't about church or religion or any of this stuff. It was about experience, you know. It was like a real experience. And then when you have that experience, you start to see God in different areas in your life. It's like, eh, that spirit, that's something different. You know what I mean? And when you start recognizing that, you build a relationship and you don't need some church or some people telling you, this is how you do it, beating you with the Bible. Nah, it's you and God. And that's what I like about AA because they introduce you to your higher power. It's just like, just believe in the higher power. Yeah. Wherever he takes you from there, that's where he takes you. You got to believe in something bigger than yourself in order exactly. to overcome, correct? Yeah, because if yeah. you've ever been addicted to some something hardcore like that, you could be like me looking at death. You know, I was destroying my body and I didn't care. You know what I mean? So, and for me, you know, like, um, I, I ended up adding more to, you know, my... Uh, my faith, you know, I really do believe in Jesus Christ. And, you know, I don't claim to be born again Christian or go to church or any of that. But out of all the spiritual teachings in the world, that's the one that makes more sense for me. You know, like a sacrifice, you know, atonement. Like, I'm a bad guy. You know, I've been a bad guy. I've done some bad things, you know. And uh, I deserve to be dead. You know, and and but I have redemption, you know, because of uh, Jesus Christ. You know, so I'm yeah, not man. trying to preach to you guys. No, nah, not at all. I'm a believer yeah. too, brother. I'm a believer too. I don't go to church, but I, I I have a relationship. I have a personal relationship with God, and that's what it's about. Yeah, I have a yeah. personal. I don't need to. I don't need to go high signing. I ain't got to go gang banging with the Bible underneath my armpit. You know what I mean? I just like it, it's an intimate relationship, and we, we talk often. I'll say that. And for me, you know, like, I don't want to preach to anybody or anything like that, you know, and... If you feel thing, the need to say something, say it, brother. Well, I, I do, you know, uh, because, you know, like, uh, one of the things about AA is, you know, they stay away from politics and, and religion, you know what I mean? Because they don't want to shut the door. They don't anybody. want to scare somebody away, right? Well, yeah. it's like, I don't care about politics. I don't care about the left, the right, the this, the that. You know, none of that stuff is any of my concern. I don't care about that. But if you're broken or you're living in hopelessness, drug addiction, alcoholism, suicidal, depression, homelessness, if you're down, then I got a message for you because I've been there. I've been there. That was me. And God saved me in every way imaginable. Absolutely. So that is a message. You know? Absolutely. I don't care about politics, but I do care about people's lives. Absolutely. You know. And so do we right here at Hoodstocks, brother. So do we. And that's why we have individuals like yourself that have, you know, 15, 16 years away from it. And we have cats that are just beginning their journey right here. And we always try to promote change and just, you know, believing in yourself, you know, investing in yourself. That's faith. The, the, that's faith. And that's yes. you got to have faith to do that, too. You know, I gotta take a quick break. I gotta, I gotta pee. I'm sorry, brother. Yeah. Quick break. Yes, Freddie, yeah. I got some questions for you. Actually, all right. So, who are your top five tattoo artists of all time? But you can't name yourself. I want to know your list. Oh man, I was on the top five. No, I kidding. know you. Um, you know, geez, man, you're gonna get me in big trouble. It doesn't uh, have to be in any particular order. Well, you know, of course, Ed Hardy and Jack Rudy because. You know, Jack Rudy was the man that, that taught me everything and got me in the business. And uh, he's been a dear friend forever and ever. And uh, Ed Hardy, you know, took me under his wing. Um, you know, 
loved me like I was his son, you know. And then I got to say Mark Mahoney because even when I was at my worst, you know, his doors have always been open, you know, at Shamrock. And that's why I call Shamrock my home. Mark Mahoney is uh, not only a great artist and uh, dynamic personality, but he's a good friend, you know. And so I got to put him there. And um, two more. You know, uh, you know I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say Corey Miller, you know, okay. because uh, he's just a good friend, you know. And uh, and I, I enjoyed watching. You know, I, I remember when he came up to me, he told me that he was, uh, you know, uh, thinking about going on on uh, uh, L.A. Inc. You know, with yeah. Kat Von D. And he's like, I don't know. He goes, everybody's telling, you know, Mark, everybody told him, don't do it. It's, it's You're selling out, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, man, do what you want to do. You should do this show. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, because one thing... One thing you're always going to get out of it is everybody's going to want to get tattooed by you. Yeah. And that's the idea, you know, it's dope. is to keep that calendar full. And um, and we just uh, been good friends and and together we're working on this tattoo show and stuff. And so I got to put him in there. So you got one spot left. You know, the one spot that I have left. Oh, God. You know, like I wish I could put everybody else in that spot. Yeah. I'm. You know, uh, I'm going to say Carlos Torres. Um, or should it be Tommy Montoya? I, you know, there's so many. But, yeah. you know, Carlos Torres uh, represents a, a group of youngsters that that reignited the black and gray scene. You know, like it kind of, you know, leveled out. And then all of a sudden, these, these youngsters... Carlos and Tommy Montoya and Mikey Montoya and Steve Soto and 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 you know uh, uh, Roman just I I could go on all these yeah. guys all of a sudden all at once started just killing the game and they they uh, brought it back they brought they brought tattooing up to a new level yeah and uh, so I think Carlos Torres was kind of like. At the helm of that crazy level, bro. Yeah, yeah so. some of these pieces, man, are just fucking ridiculous, bro. So that's but, my, you, but you've had to evolve yourself too, which you have. Well, the thing is, since I've been sober, you know, uh, one of the things I realized, you know, like during all that time, the hospital, all that stuff, you know, like uh, I also need to talk about my my son Isaiah, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I let tattooing get away from me, you know, I, I, I. Uh, I didn't care, you know? And then when I got this new focus, you know, uh, being sober and trying to like, like now I'm gonna focus on my work and stuff. And then all of a sudden all these youngsters are just killing the game. I'm looking at what they're doing and I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, uh, this is a lot better than what I'm doing. You know, like I'm still tattooing like the seventies, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? And um, and my son too, you know, he, he, he was, you know, kind of, Doing the style that I was doing, yeah. and together we started seeing, you know, what was uh, what was out there, and I started, you know, we started going to shows, we started following, you know, all of a sudden Instagram came on the scene, you know, like uh, Facebook. Um, I started, you know, seeing, you know, how are they doing this? You know what I mean? Like, what are these youngsters doing that's making their work look so good? You know, and so basically, I became teachable. You know what I mean? Like. I never wanted to see myself as so great, like I'm this, I'm that. It's like, no, uh, I'm trying to get better, you know? And I need to be teachable. What are these youngsters doing? You know, how can I bring my work up to that level? I don't want people to come to me for souvenir tattoos and get a little smile and I'll cry later from Freddie and the Grady. <laughs> hey, can you fit that right here? Tomorrow I have an appointment with Carlos and I'm going to get my whole arm done. You know, it's just like, yeah. no, nah, I didn't want that. I wanted to be, I like it when people make an appointment with me and they come and get tattooed and they don't even know who I am. You know what I mean? They just, they saw my work on online or on Instagram or something, you know, and, and they made the appointment because of my work, not because of uh, me being Freddie or something. You know what I mean? I get it. Yeah. So, um, 
and you know, I've made all the changes. Like I, I remember I go back to the shop to Shamrock with Mark and after a show and I go, look at, we got this and that, the kids are doing this, you know what I mean? Like, what are the kids doing, Freddie? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I mean, I made all the switches, you know, I switched the rotaries, you know, the cartridges, uh, you know, and just uh, whatever it takes, you know, the, ju the end justifies the means, whatever it takes to make my work be the best that it can be until I get better because I have not arrived. You know, I'm 66, but I haven't arrived. I'm going to keep trying to get better. I'm going to keep striving to improve my work, you know? Absolutely. To the day I die. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then I got to, you know, um, you know, talk about my son, Boo Boo, Isaiah. A lot of people know him. And, you know, uh, you know, when my first son passed away, you know, I, I often realized that <clears throat> I had, you know, I used to think I was like real courageous and brave, you know, I had a lot of heart and everything. But after my son passed, I realized that I actually have a lot of fear. And, you know, I have fear that something bad would happen to somebody that I love, you know. And so when my youngest son passed away, um, I kind of smothered my son Isaiah. I didn't want anything bad to happen to him. You know what I mean? Like, and we lived together. We were roommates. We worked together at Shamrock. We did all these shows together like a team. I was always there for him and whatever he wanted, you know, like I spent most of my money on him, you know, to get his Beamer and get, you know, just say he made his own money, but I did whatever I could, you know, because I wanted to make life good for him and I wanted to be there for him, you know, at, at all times. And, we were inseparable and everybody, everybody knew this, you know, and, and he, he wasn't a dope addict, like that did dope every day or whatever, but he would periodically do it, you know, like, and he would do speed or some coke and then he'd lock himself in his room and he'd be in there till he came down and then he wouldn't do it again for weeks or whatever. And <clears throat> so, uh, he, he locked in his room and he was doing some, whatever it was, coke. They said they found coke, but, and then I hadn't heard from him, you know, and I was calling and texting him, you know, and, and um, finally I, his door was locked and I was knocking on it. So I opened it with a screwdriver and my son was on the floor dead, you know, and just, you know, uh, um, as, Another dark, dark time in my life. My, you know, my greatest fear had happened, you know, and uh, it just, just killed me, you know. Um, it's very difficult, you know. I, I could have, uh, I could have easily just killed myself. I, at the time, I really felt, I, you know, you don't feel a reason to live. And what I had to live, you know, I was trying to, to make a good life for my son and be a good example to him. I wanted him to live long and, and you know, be ha live happy and you know. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, thankful. Thankfully, my my daughter was there for me, Elizabeth, my grandson Vinny, and uh, all the crew at Shamrock. Everybody was there to uplift me. I didn't feel any need to use or anything. And then uh, also God brought the most amazing person into my life. And that's my girl, Deja. You know, she became everything to me. She she loved me. She, you know, uplifted me, you know. She gave me a reason to live, you know, to live for my girl, my daughter, my grandsons. and. I do have a reason to live. Uh, life is hard and difficult times are gonna come, but I don't have to throw my life away on drugs or anything. God is still there for me. These are the things that build our character and make us strong and make us special. And so, <clears throat> so uh, not long after that, my sister passed and my cat, you know, it's just like a, 
a dark storm, you know. Just a couple of weeks ago, our dog passed, you know. But this is life. This is life, and uh, and we live it, you know, to the fullest. And you know, if we can just uh, obey two simple commands, you know, which is uh, love God with all your heart and all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. This would be a good world. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Freddie Negretti, the great, the legend. Um, could we, do you mind taking a couple phone calls? Let's take some phone calls. Okay. My condolences. Brother, Thank you. Everything, Thank you, man. I've, it's been rough. It's been rough, but uh, yeah, here I am. You're gonna keep going, man. You're gonna keep, keep going. going. You're gonna keep, keep that faith. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to ask any questions about the subject you just asked. Um, I mean, you spoke on. Um. So you got a convention. Let's do this. You got. Yeah. You got a convention coming. Yeah. So you know, uh, I have a a few collabs. You know, um, one of them is my hats. You know, now I got hat hair, but. Uh, Here's one of the, where's a good camera to show the hat to? Right here, brother. Yeah, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's these hats are with uh, uh, Summit Lowrider hats. And, uh, you know, I designed the art on it. I designed the hat, you know. It's a badass hat, bro. Yeah. That, well, we had headphones for you, and I'm like, nah, bro, that hat is too hard, bro. So <laughs> yeah. we, we got we got him Casey's uh, little uh, earphones right here, and it worked out. So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. You know, so uh, this is just one of the designs, you know, like I'm in it for seven designs. Uh, it's all Chicano style, you know, our, our culture. I have another hat with a smile, not cry later. Um, and then another hat coming out, Santa Muerta. Yeah. I have clown girls, Aztec, uh, Chara, revolutionary, you know, so. Where can they purchase those hats at? Uh, you know, I don't I don't sell them. It's just a collab that I do with the company. And actually, Summit Lowrider hats. You could follow them on Instagram. Okay. That um, they they are actually a wholesaler. Mm. So, and and their main thing was uh, actually cowboy hats. You know, to the paisas. You know, they, you know how they love mm-hmm. cowboy hats. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's their main market. But they wanted to, you know, uh, do you know uh, the the culture style hats. You know, Chicano style hats. Low rider hats, you know. So they started doing them. They got Danny de la Paz, his line of hats, and they got me, you know. So um, you can get the hats from. Ah. You said it's a wholesaler, Summit? Summit's a wholesaler, but all, you can go on their website and you could see the people that retail the hats. Got you, got you. So goes. I'm trying to think of. Uh, of the company that people are ordering offline right now. Let me get this call real quick. Okay. Let's get this call. Let's how about us get this call. Uh, you're on Hoodstocks. Talk to us. <laughs> Yo, what up, Lucky? Thanks for taking my call, man. Shit. What up, Rooster? Shit, not much, man. First off, fuck you, motherfucker. I love you too, hey. baby. Hey, Fred, uh, Fernando, OG, Freddy, <laughs> the legend, the mm-hmm. motherfucking goat for Chicano tattooing, dog. Man, it's, I, I, man, Lucky taking my call right now. I appreciate this. This is like, by far my most favorite interview. Literally, you're like, man, you're a legend. Just like I said, R.I.P. Triggs, R.I.P. Norm, R.I.P. Boog. You're really like a big factor in this whole, man, like, you've done a lot for me. I'm a tattoo artist out here in Tucson, Arizona, man. And, like, just your story, everything, man, you like, you're the originator of this shit. And I salute you. For real, OG. Uh, gracias. Yeah, hell yeah, get Pachuco hat, man. That shit, man, that shit goes so hard. You're fit. Just keep the G the way you do, you know what I'm saying? Like, I love your Stilo OG. Like, and it's a, it's an honor. It's a pleasure just getting to holler at you and just tell you these words. Like, you're the goat of this, man. And that's real shit right there. I appreciate that, bro. Hell yeah, man. And shit, uh, Casey, man, you look like Pete Davidson, fool. The fuck you do to your hair, homie? God damn. I woke up like this, fool. <laughs> a, a, a gay oh, ghost. Uh, yeah. A gay yeah. ghost visited him last night <laughs> and dyed his hair. This is how I, I want to fuck this little man. Oh, shit. 
Hey, and OG, Freddie, man, listen to this. I've been trying to tattoo a dick on Lucky. He don't want me to do it, man. Try to convince homeboy. <laughs> let me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> better be, yeah, yeah, better be a beautiful homie. dick. <laughs> what, what you, what you hey, do nah. is you don't have to convince yeah. him. You just you just do it. You, if you look hard at anybody's tattoos, you're going to find a dick <laughs> in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> You know, I'm glad you're not here. I'm glad you're not here right now, Rooster, because you'd be trying to get your titty signed or something, bro. I don't know, bro. You'd be fanning out or something, though. You. Hey, man, much love. Freddie, all y'all, man. I love y'all. Hood stars going up. Freddie, man, sorry for your losses. I, I, I feel that pain, man. I go through it, too. That's just a humbling ass shit. We ain't promised tomorrow and just got to grind hard, harder for the next day, man. Yeah, I love right. you so much. I love you, man. I really honestly love you, dog. You the go with this Chicano art, dog. Like this tattoo shit. You created like a whole like I know your stories before this right here and just hearing it on Hoodstocks, it's just way better than any other motherfucking interview that I heard straight up. Uh, I love hearing yeah, this story, thanks. man. And on this platform right here, you you done blessed lucky. I love this shit, man. Keep yeah, that shit absolutely. going, Lucky. I, I love, love you, you too, dude. my boy. That's a lot of love yeah. right here, baby. A lot of love. <laughs> love is yeah, amazing, yeah. bro. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. if you could be in a room full of love all the time, bro, it, man. But there's, you know, then you got the haters, dog, and they pulling up, you know, with blonde hair, <laughs> undercover, <laughs> you know, undercover hater. Anyways, Rooster, thank you for calling, brother. Thank you, dog. Salute to all of y'all. Much Just, love. Hey, dog, stay out this man's DM, though, all right, bro? You know, I don't want to see no <laughs> rooster flicks on that bitch, dog. You know what I mean? Looking like a pluck, looking like a pluck chicken, dog. <laughs> all right, doggy. Have a good one, brother. All right, dog. <laughs> so, I'm sure you get that a lot. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. You know, again, like I said, you know, I... I don't think uh, that highly of myself. I just try to, you know, uh, be the best that I could be. But, you know, I, I, I'm a gangster and I learned how to do this in prison, you know, so. Shit. <laughs> Freddy <laughs> Negretti. Let's get this Let's get this call right here. Right. You're on Hoodstocks. Lucky. Yeah, what's cracking? Hey, yo, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, though. Hello? Mm-hmm. Lucky. Yes. Hi, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was doing a podcast right now. <laughs> Don't call. These fucking assholes, man. Well, Freddie, this has been a legendary time sitting with you, brother. And I just want to thank you so much, like Rooster said, for blessing this platform, brother. Well, in that case, let's uh, talk about the convention. Let's do it. Yeah, All right, let's so. do it. Yeah. So actually, uh, wait, hold on. Let's get the San Diego call real quick. Yeah, San Diego. Let's go. You're on Hoodstocks. Talk to us. Yo, yo. Just wanted to call in and say, God damn, this is an amazing podcast interview. Just like the caller before said, I've heard the story about the Chicano artists right here and other um, interviews, but God damn, lucky you. You fucking pulled the real story out this guy, this OG right here, bro. And I, don't know, I just want to say, yeah. and uh, I just seen the fucking uh, on IG. They asked who got the best podcast. We had to put fucking hood socks on that shit. <laughs> Yeah, we coming up. We're yeah. on our way up, baby. You know, we're on our way up, and it's, it helps a lot when we have legends like this. Most definitely. You know when, when right. and, and any you too, brother. You too, you too. Thank any you. any man that that sits in that chair and speaks from his heart, it doesn't matter, you know who he is, where he came from. I mean, when someone speaks from them heart, from their heart, man, it really transpires through these airwaves, you know, these internets, right? Um, and I feel like I don't I don't know. I know you've done a lot of interviews. I'm not going to say, well, what was your favorite interview, or you know, what I mean, it's probably just another interview, but um. Uh, this is a good one I, I, because, <clears throat> um, you know, I really, I really opened up uh, on this one. I had a good time. You're a great host, and uh, you got a great crew here. It's just, uh, I'm so glad I, I did this. You know what I mean? Like, our natural incl inclination is to put things off, but I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to do these things. You know, I wanna, I wanna, um, you know, I wanna get my story out, but I wanna get my word out. Um, 
you know, I'd like people to see what I'm doing, you know, my work and, you know. And so speaking of the work, we got a convention. What date is yes. this convention? So it's June 2nd, 3rd and 4th. So that's coming around the corner here at the Ontario Convention Center. Uh, so <clears throat> when we first, uh, you know, uh, actually it's uh, Trusted Tattoo. That's my girl's tattoo shop and uh, her crew there, Joey and and. And well, she sold the shop to Joey, and uh, but anyways, the crew there, Jordan and Elvis and and my girl and Joey, you know, we talked about doing a, a a tattoo convention at the Pachanga Casino, you know, yeah. uh, because uh, we do a convention in in New Mexico that's in a casino. That's a lot of fun. I can imagine. <laughs> Muffles coming in drunk. <laughs> or, or hit the hit the hit some money and they, they yeah they, they loosen their machines up it's like they know all these people are gonna loosen them up you know it's just like, <laughs> you know let's go give, give these people a little few jackpots they're gonna come back yeah so anyways uh, i always win you know at that so anyways we thought pachango would be a great place you know like and uh you know so you know things uh started rolling and then the the uh pandemic hit uh, and um you know all everything fell through and even after things opened up, it was all a new, you know, new management there at the casino. They're like, tattoos? Hell no. You know what I mean? And and so for me, you know, like, I was over it. You know what I mean? Honestly, I was kind of over it. And But uh, Deja and Joey and them, and they, they were still determined. And they started doing things on their own. And they, they uh, you know, they got, got things squared away at the Ontario Convention Center. They started getting the ball rolling, doing the work, and they got me fired up. Yeah, you know. Yeah. At first, he was like, "All you have to do is just host. Don't do anything. We'll take care of everything." But nah, nah, I'm into this, you know. Yeah. And uh, I got Corey Miller, you know, uh, as a host with me. Nice. And uh, we got all the best tattooers, you know. Everybody. Slipknot. No, Corey Miller. Who's Corey Miller? Corey Miller was on LA Inc. LA, yeah. okay. Who am I thinking? I'm thinking of a dude from the well, singer from. Uh, there is Corey from Slipknot. Slipknot. Slipknot yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, but we got, you know, like Carlos Torres and, you know, uh, Nico Hurtado and yeah. Robert Foe, uh, Roman, just Bishop Rotary is sponsoring, Solon Clothing sponsoring. Um, Solon's bringing in all these European artists. Damn. You know, we got Jesse Yen doing his Japanese stuff. We got Ricky Boy doing the Tatao, you know, the. Oh, shit. Uh, you know, and. um and you know Tommy Montoya and all those guys, you know Cryptic, uh, the guys, all the guys from Cryptic Tattoo. Those they're, are bad, bro. Yeah, they're, they're coming in. They're gonna, they got a big six booths. You know, they're gonna have their lowrider car in there. You know, Sick. and they, have you ever been to a convention? See, they all tattoo with their shirts off. Yeah, <laughs> they're cool. Man. I, I usually just tattoo my pants off, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I got no customers. We on, should bro. try that. Just tattoo naked. Yeah, just butt like, naked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know the list goes on. So we we got <laughs> we got the people. You know, we oh, he's got trying the to get the artists. back tattoos naked. Huh? <laughs> no, go ahead. Huh? And uh, but you know, so we want to get the people. It's in the IE. Yeah. You know? But the right there in Ontario at the convention center, that's the IE. So all these people in the IE, they're they're I see them. They're all inked up. Yeah. They love tattoos. Yeah. You got to come to our convention, LA. Come on, it's just right there. Yeah. Come to our convention, Orange County. Come to our right up the 10 freeway, baby. Yeah. Yeah. You right up the I mean? 10 freeway. So we want to yeah. get the word out all that we can, you know, because we want people to come to this convention and, you know, maybe get tattooed. Uh, yeah, get tattooed, you know, but all the best artists are going to be there. It's always fun to watch them work. Uh, we got some other things going on. What always. are the benefits of going to these conventions? Sorry for cutting well, you off. Well, for one thing, you know, like, uh, you know, a lot of people know about all these artists from Instagram. 100%. You know what I mean? And uh, and so when they have an opportunity to meet them and maybe get some work from them, maybe if, if not even from them, from somebody from their crew, you know, they they love to come out and watch people getting tattooed. Yeah. And, you know, there's a DJ, and we got other things going on, too. Well, all the greats underneath one roof. At, you know, at, That's yeah. dope. Catching everybody, still, catching everybody at the same goddamn time. You know, right? and everybody's doing their their different things. You know, like selling their merch, or you know, like uh, they got their own things going on. Is it cheaper know? though at the conventions? I mean, uh, is it is it is conventions usually like cheaper or 
Or do people expect that tight motherfuckers like me, half Jewish motherfuckers, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, you know, I think... It's the Jew side, you know what I mean? I, I, think, uh, I, I think the tattoo pricing is pretty much what a person normally tattoos. Like, before it was like, oh, you're at a convention, you got to pay 10 times more, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like that anymore. Who I haggles think, the worst on tattoos? What race, bro? Go ahead and say it, though. <laughs> Who's trying Give to get the best us. deal, bro? Uh, you know... You know, <laughs> no, your wife's saying don't do it, don't do it. Are your girls saying don't do it? Don't do it. No, which is I don't want to put you there, bro. Yeah, it was it's, actually it's, a joke. It's hard Sorry. to say. I I think it's an individual thing. You know, like so. Uh, I like when people say, "Hey, I want to get this tattoo from you. This is what I want." Da 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 da. And then other people, most people will say, "How much would you charge for?" Da, 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 da? I'm just like, not gonna tattoo you. Yeah. Never mind what I charge. Let's see. Just talk about your work. I'm just kidding. You got to tell them how much you can charge, but you could kind of tell, you know, like people, they see good work. It's just like, okay, I like this guy's work. I'd like to get tattooed. I'm going to pay it. How much does he charge or how much do you charge? Let me get the best deal here. But if somebody wants to get tattooed by you, it doesn't matter what you're charging. hundred percent. hundred percent. Check it out. I got my girl's portrait on my, uh, on my leg, right? My, my calf. And, um, I knew an artist that I wanted I wanted to fuck with. It was actually uh, Jeff Plunkett out of uh, fucking, uh, anyways. And I didn't ask him, bro. I didn't ask him. Was I a little surprised on how uh, how uh, expensive it was at the end? Yeah, but fuck it. I mean, I I had a, I was I figured that I could still be in the range of what the cash I had on me. You know what I mean, but anyways, um, like you said though, you know. If you want to get tatted by that artist and you like his work, bro. Southgate. Yeah. Southgate, and also, yeah. Also, you Coco, know what? Coco, Coco yeah. Pelli. Coco, Coco Pelli. Pelli. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Coco, like, for me, uh, um, you know, people are always telling me, you know, like, oh, your prices are too low. Man. You raise your price. Da, 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 da. And I know we're inflation and all this stuff, but I don't know. I, st I haven't raised my price. I got reasonable prices. I, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if I can live well and, and, uh, and, you know, take care of my family and do do some fun things, and you know, then you know I'm not trying to charge two thousand dollars just for a little. Well, you're a little different though, bro, because you came from an era, bro, at one point in time where you were doing tattoos for sopas and fucking heroin, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying, dog? Dude, that's so you know? smart of you to say that because it's so it's just hard different mentality, to, ga bro. to gauge the price. I mean, I was tattooing for soup, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but I think he wants a fucking Ed Hardy style tattoo on his ass, bro. <laughs> Did you bring your gun? Don Ed Hardy. <laughs> He's like, I got my buns. Where's your gun? No. Yeah. My bad. So, bro. yeah, it, it's hard to gauge. I mean, and then we're in inflation, so we, we don't even know what our money's worth. You know what I mean? Like, $9 for some eggs? Wait a minute. Yeah. You know, well, that, like, well, that's how, how you. How much is this my money worth? I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like, what can I buy with it? You know, so how, how much did I charge? I couldn't afford it, you know, uh, $2,000 for a tattoo right now. Could other people, you know, it's just, I, you know you, what I mean? Sir. Thank you, You know so how I'm I, trying to work it out. You know how I work fair. out the infl in inflation is Stouffer's lasagna. You can get it at Walmart, bro. The family size Stouffer's lasagna used to be only be like ten ninety nine, bro. I mean, and now it's seventeen ninety nine, dog. Damn. That's inflation on that Stouffer's lasagna fa crazy. family style, bro. You know, that's and crazy. so that that's I go off of Stouffer's lasagna <laughs> with now the, with my uh, uh, financial. How much does my Stouffer's cost? Yeah, and that that's my calling up Walmart. <laughs> hey, that's my financial gauge, my inflation gauge. Yeah, my this uh, friend of ours came in the shop he was with a Subway sandwich. He's going, dude. I I wanted I was trying to save money because my tattoo, you know, and so I, I got Subway. But it costs 16 bucks for this. <laughs> oh, shit. Somebody take it out of his hand and go, hit him in the head with it. Did you get it at the kosher store? What happened to the $5 foot long, man? <laughs> there's yeah. A, yeah, right? There's a kosher uh, 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 subway, you know, in, in uh, Jewish uh, yeah. Pico Boulevard, that area. Makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, for a sandwich, is like 30 bucks. Damn, what? You know, yeah. Kosher is expensive, bro. If you want to have prayers over your food and... All the blood soaked up. And just you. Damn. 
Because I, I was like, oh, oh, I want to eat. I want to try this kosher. Uh, How do you think Freddie's still alive, bro? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Buying them kosher sandwiches, yeah, dog. Come on, sense, now, dog. Put the shit together, bro. <laughs> and that's funny. So the he last time, when I was in the county jail before, you know, go, going into that Jewish rehab, they were like, okay, so, um, you know, you, you go to, uh, they have Shabbat here at the jail. You know, and so I was like, oh, okay, I'll go, you know. So I went to the Shabbat. And the rabbi was there, you know, there he was cool and everything. And then, you know, most of the uh most of the Jewish guys were wearing light blue, you know, like uh PC. Because they're they're scared that the white supremacists are gonna jump on them or something. And I was telling him, dude, you should come out of that PC, just come on the road. Just tell me nobody's gonna care. You know what I mean? Just don't PC it up. But anyways, so after the service, they break out this big old feast, you know, of kosher food, you know. And man, you know, and we're in jail. It's just like, wow, you know, all this gefilte up fish and just all this stuff. <laughs> that was kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, so there was uh, this uh, one white boy that I, I knew. I knew him from prison. He's a Nazi, you know what I mean? Like, even has Nazi tattoos and stuff, you know? And uh, so I, I go down there to service, and all of a sudden he walks, and he's like, I just found out I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid ass dudes. The white dudes in prison are the dumbest. No, nah, I'm not going to say it like that. But they'll be getting these tattoos and they just don't really know the death. Because probably some of them, a lot of them are Jewish. But they're like, hey, I'm white. So that means I'm fucking a Nazi. And then you see them seeing the, watching the war movie and they got a tear going down their fucking cheek, dog. It's like, come on, bro. Get the fuck out of here, dog. You would have never survived it, dog. You, you know what I mean? You ain't made like that, bro. Yeah. So, so I didn't say nothing. You know, I knew him. And he's like, hey, Fred. Yeah, I'm Jewish. I just did it. And then he's like, mm, you're going to eat that? <laughs> just like, <laughs> Jewish feast. All right. All right. Anyways, just cute story. So Convention Center, June? 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, Ontario Convention Center. Uh, it's uh, Trusted Tattoo Gathering, Inkcon. Inkcon. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, we're and we're we're still uh, tattooing out of Shamrock. I mean, what is what is the waiting list looking like to get a tattoo from you? Um, you know, I could give a, a, I'll tell you a secret, you know, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm booked, uh, probably till August, you know, but, um, what I do is, uh, you know, um, I keep one day a week open for people out of state and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, and also I, I do my own cancellation list. So if you DM me and say, Hey, I want to get on your cancellation list. And if you want a portrait or something I really want to do, you know, like yeah. you're going to get in faster. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, you want to see about getting in faster, just DM me and say, Hey, can I get on your cancellation list? Plus I leave one day open a week and then show up with a picture of you. <laughs> I did a get his ass in here. <laughs> handsome man right here. Who is this guy? <laughs> That's uh, dope, bro. And yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's it's smart, bro, that you do leave one day open for, like you said, out of state, aka maybe some famous people, right? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Big ballers. I, I hate to say yes, but yes. Um, and then you know, so if somebody's like, "Hey, you know, uh, I'm trying to work out a trip," you know, it's it's around March. I come from New York, and it's just like, okay, what week do you want to come? And then I have that one day. Okay, I'll put you in right there. That's dope, bro. Yeah, so that's dope. Just try to. And like I said, I do my own cancellation list, you know, so. Yeah. Still, hand, <clears throat> still hands on. With and that, I don't huh? take deposits, you know, so everybody takes deposits. You, you want to get tattooed, okay, you're going to have to pay a deposit, 200 bucks, whatever it is. So I don't take deposits. So if you don't show up for, if you had to cancel your appointment, I don't care. I got somebody else I'll put in there. You know what I mean? Because I got this list, you know, and I'm trying to get people in. So if you cancel on your appointment, Bye. I got somebody else for it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know. Hey, let's let's make it official official on Hoodstocks. Whoever shows up to Shamrock Tattoo this week with a case of soups, he's gonna get a smile on our later. Imagine, bro, fucking, fucking lying yeah. around the block. Yeah, chili lime. I know he like chili lime. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we were just fuck, I'm just fucking around. You know, the thing is, I couldn't. You know, like, uh, so the last uh, uh, the last time I went, you know. Uh, so the, my last three months was in uh, Folsom Ranch. And Folsom Ranch is the last place, like, like it's on the outside of the walls. It's this ranch on rolling hills and granite columns. 
and a river, Folsom River going by, and there's deer and all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's like an inspiration point. You know what I mean? And uh, and the the they were turning a blind eye to my tattooing, you know. And so I was tattooing every day, and I had the woods. They're pretty crafty with the machines. They were making all spe- special machines for me, and yeah. everybody had their own needles, you know, so we weren't spreading disease and stuff. But I had soups coming out of my ears, dude. It's just like <laughs> under everybody's bed. It's like, here's another case of soup. I don't even eat this shit, you know. It's just like, but it was money. It yeah. Was money, you know what I mean? Like, yes, sir. We had soup everywhere, but I got my TV and all that stuff with soup, you know. What was your favorite spread? Well, uh, your the, recipe, the way you liked it. The the one I I like is when you could put the most shit in it that you get from the store. Like, you know, they they have uh, that tuna that's in a you know a t- a foil bag. You know what I mean? So, um, the, the pouch. Yeah. You know, I want as least amount of s- top ramen in there. Yeah. You know, it's just give me some Cheetos. You know, some regular chips, some flaming hot Doritos, and tons of meat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'll even let the paisas put their homemade cheese in there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> homemade cheese. Damn. <laughs> you, ever that, you ever see that cheese? I don't want that. I'm going to throw up. I was like, what's it's, too, it's too authentic. Dude, what are you doing over there? You know, they, they would put shit under my bunk because the cops would never search my bunk. You know, like, he's like, uh, what the fuck is that? I, are you making pruno? And he goes, no, it's just queso. <laughs> Queso. <laughs> and I'm like, what? So Mixed with it with a little cocoa butter? It, it looked like Jalisco <laughs> cheese, you know? Like, Are you sure it's not Jalisco? Remember Jalisco cheese? It's like killed all kinds of people. But oh, shit. but anyways, you know, you just get the milk and yeah, wrap it and in you, a bag. And you let it rot. Yeah. And just, yeah, you let you it let rot. You let the curdle, yeah. you know? And it's, it works. it's actually pretty good. Yeah, it's actually mix, pretty good. You mix it with wow. salt. But when you said uh, the Paisa's cheese, this fool right here was cheesing out, bro. Because he was thinking something else, bro. You know what I mean? Fucking nasty fuck. I was scared for you. Dirty little. dirty. That's a dirty little man right there. Blonde hair. <laughs> bro, that shit is not the Pete, business. Who said Pete, Pete Davidson is, he looks like. <laughs> oh, I don't know what possessed hey, you to do that, dog. Someone said I now identify as Cassandra. Because... <laughs> Oh my God, dog! Like, fuck. You look like a you look like a, a young fucking Helen. What was that broad's name? The Helen had, Keller, the blind dead. No, the one that had the talk show. What was her name? Generous. Oh, Ellen. Ellen, you look like a young <laughs> Ellen with a mustache, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fuck you. <laughs> These guys. So you. So yeah. I mean, I feel it. Put everything in it. You know what I mean? Put yeah, everything yeah. in it. Mix That's that bitch my up. Favorite spread. Call it good. Yeah. There's so yeah. many recipes nowadays. So much it's crap. nuts. Yeah, I you know like and uh, and and you know Taco Bell's getting on you know like all of a sudden they got Cheetos and their tacos, yeah, you know mixed with their meat. Yeah. You know it's, it's a like, home it's a wait, homie back there, bro. You got you know a taco sh- a taco shell made out of a, you know a Doritos. Dorito made out of yeah, bro. That's just <laughs> that's just like that's the perfect munchie food right there. Yeah, bro. yeah, high as fuck. Yeah, there's some happy there's, as fuck in the drive through. There's some homies yeah, yeah. in the big office. Of bro, there, I'm pissed. I mean? No, 100. percent I'm pissed. They took away the the Mexican pizza. No, homie. they brought it back. Oh, they, they brought, it brought it back. back? Yeah, they're back yeah. now. But they're it was wacko. gone for a minute, bro. But they're not the same though. They're not the same. That's always been my they're favorite. They're not the same. No, that Mexican the same. pizza, dude. Ooh. Those are fire. That shit is so fucking fire. Yeah, they brought them back, but with like some random ass fucking wrappers or something. I was like, what the fuck. Man, they need to Lame. get back to that original recipe, dog. That was the shit right there. Just like this uh, sitting down with you, my G, has been the shit, brother. This has been legendary. I mean, thank you so much. We got food right here, so I'm thinking that uh, everybody's hungry. They want to yeah. eat, yeah. you know, and um, I just want to just, I can't stop thanking you, bro. I thanked you before you came, and I'm going to thank you when you leave again, brother. Um, this has been an honor. It's been a pleasure, um, and just thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Everybody. Thank yeah. you and it felt me. like you got loose, man. You got, got loose, loose and you just, you felt good. I, I mean, you with it, the boys right here, bro. Yeah, you know? just let it come out. You know what I mean? Like, uh, maybe it was a little or- unorganized or whatever, but no, we're telling good. stories here. It's hood stuff. Oh, that was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You ain't got no, some professional dude trying to keep <laughs> going bad. Hold on, yeah. Freddy. Bag it up a little, but I do do that sometimes stories. and everybody hates it, bro. They're like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> let it go the way it goes, yeah. dude. They talk so much shit to me, dog. That they got me thinking sh- about some shit, you know. Like, nah, gotta you get right great. sometimes. You know I mean, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I fuck it yeah. up though. Yeah. Good. June second, third yeah. and fourth, Ontario Convention Center. 
Absolutely. Everybody right. give